right. That's what I thought. All right. All right. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today we have one of our favorite features on Chef AJ Live. It's McDougal Monday, where we are graced with the presence of both Dr. John and Mary McDougal. Before I introduce him to the show, I'd like to introduce a special guest who contacted me. The same thing happened last month when Dr. McDougal was on. We got an email from a gentleman who said, may I please have a few moments with Dr. McDougal to give a testimonial how his work has changed my life. And it was well received. And now people are contacting us regularly to do the same. Please welcome John. God, I just said you. DeTarcio. John DeTarcio. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Chef AJ. I know everyone wants to get to Dr. and Mrs. McDougal, and I will be as brief as possible because I'm, I also want to get to Dr. McDougal, but I am so grateful and so honored that you've given me this opportunity to thank Dr. McDougal for so much that I hold dear. I work in the television industry as a director and a cinematographer, and the job requires a lot of travel, and it's physical. And Dr. McDougal you have given me the tools I need so that I've been able to keep the energy and the strength to still have this career. While most of my peers are decades younger or long since gone, <laughs> I truly cannot thank you enough. My mother was a native Korean and my father a first generation Italian. They met during the Korean War and I was raised in Asia, born in Japan, spent the middle years in Okinawa, high school in Korea. Up until then, I was a pretty healthy kid, but then I went to Tucson, Arizona to attend college and the story changed. Everything I learned, uh, uh, af after 10 years of living here in America, I had gained 65 pounds. Now I realized from everything I learned from you that my diet had gone from being a mostly old school Asian diet to an American diet. I wish I knew you then, doctor. I spent the next 23 years yo-yoing up and down and fighting the fight. And I continued to get progressively healthier the older I got. And I was always trying because of my career, which I wanted to keep, and because of my family history. My father was 61 when he died. And he was one of five kids, every single one of them, as well as his parents, all dead of heart issues before they reached 60. That's the age I am now. And that always haunted me. It was really traumatizing and it motivated me to stay healthy. And I followed my doctor's advice, which was exercise more, eat less food, increase the pills. I was put on cholesterol medicine at 30 and blood pressure pills at 33. Yet my health continued to worsen until I stumbled across your TED talk from 2012. And I'll never forget the lights came on and you appeared so beautiful and statuesque in that tan suit and you declared, starch. Boy, I was hooked, doctor. After that powerful and amazing presentation, I knew that my life had already changed. Immediately, I looked you up online and wow, an entire universe of information that I'd been looking for came flooding in. From that day forward, I simply followed your advice and I got healthy. I started eating the foods that I loved as a kid, but feared as an adult. <laughs> I soon was prescription free and all the health came back. And it's not just me, my whole family is all in and we all reap the rewards and we approach it as our hobby and we have a lot of fun with it. And so at home, the McDougal lifestyle isn't hard because the food is so delicious and satisfying as, as you tell me all the time. But eating this way on the road is really excruciatingly hard because society makes it so. And I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, sir. I am the first to admit that when I'm in a hotel room like I am now and my team is out having dinner and I'm in this room washing potatoes in the bathroom and opening up a can of corn while they're sitting out somewhere with nice tablecloths and silverware, I can tend to feel pretty sorry for myself. But during those times, what I need more than anything is some inspiration. So what works for me is I go online, I turn on your videos and Chef AJ's videos and I listen to you preach. Not that you're preaching, but I do feel like I'm in church and I get inspired like that. And it doesn't matter how many times I hear your lessons. Every single time I watch, read, or listen to you, it gives me the strength and inspiration to get on to the next day. It has occurred to me, doctor, that my wife and I pay $1,500 a month for basic health insurance. And up until now, not much in return for it. <laughs> Meanwhile, a few bucks a month gets me YouTube. And here, I've learned from you how to literally save my own life. And I'm not exaggerating one single bit. I wish there were bigger words. So on behalf of so many out there 
who share parts of my story, me and my family, we thank you, thank you, thank you a million times over, sir, from the bottom of our hearts. I wish there were bigger words. Well, that's thank great, you, Chef AJ. Thank you, Dr. McDougall. Thank you, Mary. It's an honor to meet you. Let's do that documentary. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. And thank you very much. You, you, you made me feel real good for the rest of the day. It's, you know, the greatest reward is helping other people. And the message is so stupid simple. It's the food. It just fix the food. It all always happens. You get you get what you deserve. So anyway, good nice. Thank you. I John. can't tell you. I can't tell you what an honor it is to be sitting on my screen and seeing both you and Chef AJ oh. here in front of me. It is really, really, truly an honor. And thank you so much. So and John, look, what's it like? For great craft services. What's that like on the set? Do they have anything okay. vegan and healthy? I know, I know, Chef AJ, you know this because I know that you have a history in showbiz, so you're, you're feeding me that line. You know what's in there, potato chips. And the people who are, who, are, who are going out for the shopping are the young PAs just graduated from college. So, of course, they're buying, they're going to buy the big things of chips and, and uh, you know, every, anything that's in a package. I mean, and then for the healthy foods, it's the power bars. And, and bags and nuts, maybe a piece of fruit or two there. So I stay, I stay clear. <laughs> Have you ever worked on a set or a show where it was vegan friendly or anyone <laughs> health oriented? Yeah, I, the show that I've been on for ten years, that everyone is very health oriented. So um, they, they, uh, and we've been on this show for ten years. It's a small crew. The show's called Catfish, and um, we, you know, I'm the only one who completely understands. Uh, uh, Dr. McDougall's message, your message, um, but they're all very, very interested, and everyone, everyone tries. So yeah, we do have a, a pretty healthy, uh, healthy crew, but but I do stay stay clear from the from the catering and the <laughs> and all that stuff. I make the food myself in my hotel rooms. In fact, right here, that bag right there is full. That's my kitchen that goes everywhere with me. And has all my utensils and all, all the tricks that I need to get me through the road. Do you travel with an instant pot? I that used to be my instant pot, and and everyone knows it as oh, you know, and they always fool me like oh, the instant pot didn't make it. But uh, I've actually moved on to I need I need faster faster ways to go about it. So I I do carry a lot of microwavable brown rice and white rice and and uh, and uh, you know cans of beans and corn, and then I always try to find a grocery store and I buy frozen vegetables and I just microwave it all together. And like Dr. McDougall said, you eat like this. And, and of course, a potato mitt, sir, I would never ever leave without a potato mitt to make myself potatoes. But I never, as Dr. McDougall says, I never, never tire of it. And in fact, I cannot tell you the amount of times the crew members go, boy, I wish I had what you had. <laughs> that looks way better than what we ordered. Well, I bet they wish what you had in terms of health too. I, you know, I, uh, I think they all waiting, waiting to get older. So, since I'm about 20 years older than the youngest people on my crew, they all think they have time, but, uh, but, uh, and you know, various degrees of that. Right. Well, <laughs> but I, I do believe it trickles down and people learn and they hear the message and they get better. And I see my crews getting better and better. All thank you to Dr. McDougall. And, uh, and, and I have a personal personality more like Dr. McDougall. I'm not one that just goes, oh, I'm doing my thing. Don't anybody worry about me. If someone else to get an earful of it. And I, you know, I, one person at a time, doctor, one person at a time. <laughs> We're getting your message out. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a battle that needs a big army. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm your field general. I, I am, I'm out here fighting the fight and I'm so grateful Look at all. I mean, you know, I just have, as you can see, I probably have, I have a lot of energy <laughs> wow. and I'm, and I'm well, so grateful well. every single day. I'm so grateful to you, Chef AJ and, 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 and your message. And I thank you. And now, of course, I can tell Chef AJ needs to move on. You need to move on because people like me need to hear the rest of this. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, John. Thank you so much. Take care. So, Dr. McDougall, you have fans everywhere. Well, you know, it's, I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Uh, people often come up to me and they say, you know, I'm sure you're tired of hearing this. I go, no, I'm not. <laughs> you know, I love to hear that I helped other people. Who wouldn't? What a reward to be able to have a gift to give other people to make their lives better. 
I'm a very, I'm the luckiest doctor in the world. My patients get well. You heard me say that. So yeah, it's, uh, it's great, uh, AJ. And I have to say the people who have uh, negative things to say either don't appear because they've moved on or there are very, very few of them. And I think it's, it's probably both, you know, people who give a sincere try like John and you and many of the other folks out there, you, you discover the truth. And then you never look any place else for an answer because this is it. I mean, you, you know, you, you, you understand that starch is the center of your meal plan that, you know, animal foods and oils and dairy and et cetera. These are things that most for special occasions. And then you can pick the days you're sick and you can pick the days you're well. You know, it's, it's a really, really stupid, simple cost-free message. And that's part of the problem. People want, they want a sexy message. They want a Star Wars message. They want, uh, they want something that has some financial attachment to it. I don't know. Somebody can make some money off of it, then they'll tell you all about it. But it's, it's, it's the truth. It's been the truth known for 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. People live on starch-based diets. You are a starchivore, a starchitarian, a starch eater. Until you figure that out, you're dead in the water. Like you say- I really mean that, dead in the water. <laughs> The truth never changes, like you say. How do the people like how do, uh, the, the show before you, Doctor McDougall, was about a lady in in Kenya, and she was talking about the Maasai. They don't live very long. Uh, you know, I don't know how long they live, but I do know the story of, of Maasai. Uh, they were studied by George Mann, and uh, George Mann went down and studied them at the invitation of the meat industry, and by on their dime. And the reason they sent them uh, him down there, George Mann, was. <clears throat> because the Maasai are a rather unique population of people in Africa that eat a diet of meat, uh, blood and milk. And they started at their puberty years and they are relatively healthy, but they're also, they're also sheep herders and they're also spend, you know, like 10, 20, 50, 20 miles a day walking around. And, and uh, so they, they have a lot of exercise. Well, George Mann published this part, article in the journal Epidemiology and it troubled him because it didn't fit with the science that he knew. So he went back and restudied the Maasai. Instead of us asking whether they had heart disease, he did autopsies on them and looked at their coronary arteries. And in every age group, they had worse arteries than the American counterpart. It's just the arteries got very dilated because of all their exercise and, and, and the other habits that they had, you know, prevented the plaques from rupturing. So you can find that uh, diet, the, diet uh, and end of an era, ERA, in the New England Journal of Medicine, I believe it was 1978. Look it up, George Mann, diet, the end of an era. Well, oh, they, they, Maasai are an interesting population of people. They're just an exception. There are a few exceptions. There's a whole article I wrote on Inuit Eskimos and why you know, why they survive. You should read it. You should look it up on my website about Inuits. It's That's different it. doing it because you have to than because you want to. I mean, you know, they don't have a choice very much, the Inuits. Not the Inuits. No, they don't. And on the, the Maasai, of course, I don't know what the, what's their motivation is. It's probably, you know, deep in their culture. I, I don't know. But, uh, but you can't use these examples uh, to support a diet that contains uh, large amounts of animal food. It just doesn't fit. You know, you find out that the Inuit Eskimo average lifespan is 27 years. They have terrible, terrible atherosclerosis as they did 500 years ago. They found bodies that were 500 years old uh, encased in a tomb of ice and they had horrible atherosclerosis. They had horrible osteoporosis too. All this is discussed, as I say, in a diet. Uh, you just go to our website, drmcdougall.com. Look under the question and answer section and you, and you just put in Eskimo. I know that's not the proper terminology these days, but that's what science uses and that's what history uses. It'd be the easiest way to find it. You know, I, you'll enjoy the article. I had a lot of fun writing it. And, you know, now the, now the people who live in Alaska and that part of the world that, that are Native Americans, uh, they go fishing with a green lure. In other words, you drive through a fast food restaurant and you hold out a green lure and you get yourself a fish sandwich. And they ride around in, in SUVs and heated houses. And it's not like the tough old days when, um, when you had to sleep in an igloo and you had to hunt for your food and you used to burn five, six, 7,000 calories a day, you know, with that kind of difficult life. I don't, you could not survive on the McDougal diet as a, uh, as a traditional Eskimo. It just wouldn't work. It's just too rough of an environment. 
Uh, so, you know, this just shows you how adaptable the human being is, but it's not right. It's not right for the modern, the modern people in that part of the world. And it's not right for any of you who think you can justify your low carb, high meat, high protein diet with, with the example of the Inuit Eskimos, they're, they're relatively sick people. They were in the past, they were 500 years ago because of their diet that was, yeah, as you say, forced upon them. We have a very nice comment that was written uh, about you by Dina. I just saw it. That, that you, uh, Dr. McDougall's website and newsletters are an encyclopedia of nutritional knowledge, not just how to eat, but why. People appreciate your website. Uh, and I, I enjoyed, I wrote, uh, I wrote newsletters from 1986 to 2017 every month. And I enjoyed it. I used to spend one to two weeks every month doing it. And it made me a better person. I was forced to learn things, to think about things, to you know, to get to the bottom line and, you know, there's not a newsletter I need to change. And you have them all memorized. I can ask you anything and you'll tell me the exact, the exact well, you know, I work so hard. You know, I, I have to work hard to get good results. I'm not one of those gifted people that are just kind of pops up to, out of their mouth and in their brain. You know, I got to work hard. So I have to do a lot of research. I have to do a lot of thinking, you know, before I can come to conclusions that I was that I put down a paper that I knew I could live with 40, 50, 30 years later, and I have. There's nothing I have to retract that I've written that I can think of. Certainly nothing serious. And boy, oh boy, do I have a presentation for you that I would like to give. I would love to give. I just want to say that Daryl Woodruff's watching and says, Dr. McDougall is the pillar of health. Uh, Dr. Woodward, you are so great. I have made so many friends over the years, and uh, they've been through through Mary's and my work, we just have, uh, have endearing friends and the Woodwards are, are those people too. Yeah. You got a beautiful tree behind you. Yeah. You know, Mary's a real Christmas person. And so, uh, you know, one of the small things that I can do to make her really happy is to kill a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, it's beautiful. She did a great job decorating it. So anyway, nice to be with you, AJ. Always great to be with you. So we're going to talk about the breast today. We're going to talk about breast cancer today is what we're going to talk about. And, uh, you know, let me just tell you, I, I've earned the right to talk to you about breast cancer. I, I've been studying this for, for you know, my, almost my whole career, for 45 years at least. I published the first study on the dietary treatment of breast cancer. I did that in 1984. You know, I... Uh, I had a, a, a couple of relatives who made a, a huge impression on me because they died of breast cancer when I was in my early 20s. My Aunt Margie died at age 53 of breast cancer. I watched her go through a mastectomy, then a bilateral mastectomy, radiation, chemotherapy, and nothing, nothing changed the course in a positive direction. She was a miserable, bedridden. In fact, I have to say the treatments ruined her life. And then uh, my brother, who's a physician, uh, his wife developed breast cancer at age 28. They had two children. She died at age 32. My, my brother went bankrupt. Uh, you know, even though he was a physician, he went bankrupt. He had to live for the next year in my parents' basement with his two kids. I mean, so you know, I've been touched with tragedy of breast cancer, and uh, I'd, I'd like you know, I'd like to tell you what I what I believe I know is true what you need to know about this disease. And uh, what I think every doctor should be telling their patients about breast cancer. Let's see if we can get something up here. Oh, darn it. I'm <laughs> sorry, AJ. I, That's okay. Uh, I got everything ready and then I goofed it up. No worries. All right, let's see what we can do here. All right. Take your time. Okay, there, there it was. There we go. Okay. So, you know, this is, this is the conversation and I'm gonna do a series of these, AJ. I'm gonna talk about osteoporosis and, you know, all kinds of different topics uh, because I would, you know, I love seeing patients. And uh, I don't have the luxury of getting sitting down with every woman who has a problem, or every man who has a problem. So I'd like to make a series of videos with you 
about what I would what I would like to tell a patient who had breast cancer, and I think every doctor should be sharing this basic information with a patient so that she, in this case, you know, breast cancer is 100 times more common in women than it is in men. She, in this case, can make informed decisions and avoid harmful treatments and unnecessary treatments and unnecessary worry and unnecessary guilt. Tremendous amount of guilt associated around this disease. And there's a lot of emotion and a lot of lawsuits. You know, the number one reason doctors are sued is failure to diagnose breast cancer. So your doctor's scared to death. Your doctor has the hesitancy to tell you what everybody else is saying, you know, to get with the crowd, whether it's true or not. So what causes breast cancer? Well, probably environmental chemicals. Yeah, pollutants. I, I had a, a, a a patient one time who's told me she, she had breast cancer. She says, my two sisters have breast cancer too. And we live downwind from a factory. Yeah, I think the, the initiator and uh, a subsequent promotion of breast cancer are these various chemicals. And some of them are involved with estrogen. And we're gonna talk a lot about estrogen. Now it's just not the chemical spewing out in the air uh, into the soil that your crops are growing in, it has to do a lot with what you decide to eat. You know, these chemicals lie on your vegetable foods in low concentrations. As they move up the food chain, which is in your bottom left-hand corner, what you see is something called bioaccumulation happening. And the result is biomagnification of these chemicals. So maybe you start out with uh, one part per million on the grasses and grains and seaweeds and so on. And as you move up the food chain, say to the cow or the pig or the fish, because these are fat soluble chemicals, they get collected in body fat. What happens is you may increase the concentration a thousand fold. And of course the end of the food chain is that baby sucking off mother's breasts. And I've told you before that the Environmental Defense Fund did a study in 1978 where they looked at the breast milk of 1,400 women in 48 states and declared it a health hazard. The, the, the milk of Inuit Eskimos, by the way, the women, their, their breast milk is so toxic, it's been declared necessary to bury it in toxic waste dumps because of the environmental chemicals. This is a big deal. Okay, so, you know, the chemicals are there, they're all around the world. The best way to avoid them, of course, is to stay away from pollutants the best you can see and uh, also to eat low on the food chain, eat potatoes and you know, rice and corn, you know, not, not, not the animals. That's how you get into trouble. Uh, whether or not what you eat uh, affects your hormone levels and breast cancer is a hormone dependent disease. Estrogen promotes breast cancer growth. Deprivation of estrogen causes women to live longer and the effect of your diet uh, causes your estrogen levels, and we talked about this last month, causes your estrogen levels to increase as you eat the high fat American diet. In fact, they're 50% higher. Now the consequence is overstimulation of your breasts, ovaries, uterus throughout your reproductive life, but you also start your reproductive life uh, earlier. Little girls are supposed to be thinking about babies and families when they're 16, 17, 18 years old. They develop sexual characteristics or reproductive abilities when they're eight, nine, or 10 years old. Same thing with little boys, similar with little boys. And at the end of life, uh, menopause comes later for those who eat a high fat Western diet. And we know that early menarche and late menopause are associated with a dramatic risk in the chance of getting breast cancer and dying of breast cancer. So you wanna focus on your estrogen levels. Some of those chemicals I showed you in the last slide are called estrogen, uh, estrogen disruptors and, and they affect your, your hormones in tremendous ways. And anyway, I, there's a, a whole discussion of this and this particular graph is out of a book that I published in 1985 called A Challenging Second Opinion. And uh, you can get that book uh, free from our website as well as uh, I think the McDougall program for women we're now offering too free, there's no gimmicks. Just go to the website, download it, and you can read it. I wrote that in 1985, and I don't have to remove or change a single word. Nor do I really have to update much. As we talked about, I got it right the first time, and the truth don't change. So <clears throat> it's very important that you understand the following, uh, it, the following 
uh, mechanisms involved with breast cancer. It has to do with the, the growth of cancer cells. And, and it, for the rest of our discussion, you must understand this because if you understand it, then, then everything I tell you will make sense. Uh, what happens is the breast tissue, and we could talk about prostate and tell the same story in men. Uh, the breast tissue gets damaged by these chemicals. Now, most of the damage is so severe that the, the, the cells die. But, but sometimes the cells aren't injured bad enough to die, but they're bad, injured bad enough to become unneighborly. And they start doubling at their own free will. Now, cells are not allowed to double at their own free will, except under certain circumstances, like, or aren't allowed to double, period, except in certain circumstances, such as when a child grows, the cells are allowed to double. And if you injure yourself, the, the, uh, the wounds, uh, the cells proximal to the wounds are allowed to divide and close up the wound. Otherwise, the cells are not allowed to divide. But what happens is they get injured and they lose this, this, uh, this tendency to have a normal growth pattern. They start dividing at their own free will, not like wildfire. Uh, it's been determined that the average doubling time for a cell, a cancer cell, is every 100 days. Okay, so you get the first cancer cell and always one cell leads the way. A breast contains 100 billion cells per breast. A prostate, 100 billion cells also. So one cell out of 100 billion cells uh, stops obeying the rules and starts dividing at its own free will. Three and a half months later, 100 days, it becomes two cells amongst 100 billion cells. The divisions continue, eight, 12, you've had a, a cancer for a year. And you have, you know, somewhere around 12 cells lurking in a breast that contains 100 billion cells. You can't find it. And the divisions continue doubling, 32, 64. You've had cancer for two years. You've got a mass that contains about 100 cells. Nobody could find that. There's no technology that could discover these cells. You, you could set loose a team of pathologists uh, looking at your, your amputated breast. Uh, they would not be able to find these cells. All right, the divisions continue. And by the way, you know, it's, it's early in the disease that, that, that the cells break loose and go through the venous system and travel to other parts of the body. It's called metastasis. So they break loose from the tumor in the breast. They go to the liver, lungs, brain, bones, and they double at a similar time to the original cell. So here we are at two years, let's take you up to there. We got a hundred cells, the divisions continue. And finally, you've had cancer for six years. You've got a tumor mass, the size of a lead tip of a pencil, the size of a period on a paper. It consists of, a, of 1 million cells. It's not detectable by any technology available. And yet you've had cancer for six years and if it's truly cancer, and a lot of what is diagnosed as cancer really isn't, isn't life-threatening. But let's just say it's, it's, it's truly cancer. Then uh, before you can detect it, it has gone through 10, 10 years of division. You've had cancer for 10 years. It, it's a billion cells. The tumor mass is the size of an eraser of a pencil. It's a centimeter in size. Then you can find it. You know, then you can feel it on a breast. Then you can, uh, you can detect it by a blood test for prosthetic specific antigen. It's gotta, it's gotta be a centimeter in size before it's detectable. Now I wanna point out something to you. When it comes to uh, tumors that are detected early, they're usually detected by women who examine their breasts. And we're gonna talk about that. They're, they're found by the woman herself. But slow growing tumors are generally found by mammograms. On average, a tumor found by a mammogram has been dividing for 14 to 17 years. Okay, so what you understand is that before, before you even know that you're sick, the disease has already determined its course. It's already spread throughout the rest of the body. The cattle are already out of the barn before you shut the door. There's a very positive side to this message too, so just hold on with me. 
if you understand this mechanism, you understand why treatments don't work and you understand why early detection is a misnomer. You know, by the time a tumor is found, two thirds of the, of the course of the tumor has already occurred unbeknownst to the patient or the physician. You're just dealing with the last third of the disease. I uh, published this many years ago in 1985. You see the, the chart I put together and it shows the development of a tumor over a period of 13 years. You gotta understand this. It, it, it takes a long time. It's not like wildfire. It may appear like wildfire to you because you're only looking at the last third of the disease. You're only looking at a, a tremendous amount of spread that occurred long before you or your physician were aware you were sick. All right, I'll assume you understand this and I will move on to tell you, uh, not all hope is lost. I told you I, I published the first study on the dietary treatment of breast cancer back in 1984. And that, that study is available for you to look at. It's done somewhere on my website. It was many years later that the American Cancer Society finally came around to repeating my work and my conclusions. And they did so February 13, 2015. The American Cancer Society now recommends that a part of the fundamental therapy of a person with cancer, including breast, prostate, colon, melanoma, is to change their diet toward the kind of diet that you and I believe is so important. You know, this is law. This is the American Cancer Society. This is what every physician should be looking at. And what happens is you change the rate of doubling. I, I told you the average doubling time is every 100 days, every three and a half months. Well, you know, some tumors double every 23 days. That's not good. And other tumors double every, you know, 800 days. That's good. I mean, my goal is to have every one of my breast cancer patients live as long and as high a quality life as possible. So, you know, a woman destined to die in three years, maybe we could squeak 12 years out of her by not throwing gasoline on the fire, by not promoting the disease. And a woman who's destined uh, you know, to live 12 years, maybe she'll appreciate her 107th birthday. I think that's real. You could change the course of this disease. You could change the doubling times. And if you wanna, if you wanted to, to get more details on this, you can go to my February, 2015 newsletter. All right, let's talk mammograms and guilt. <laughs> you know, if you find out you have breast cancer, one of the first thoughts that comes to a woman's mind is, oh, I should have found it earlier. I, I just told you early is 14 to 17 years after the cancer starts with mammography, but you feel guilty. You're sure it was your fault and too often doctors do nothing to, to make you feel better. Let's talk about mammograms. Uh, the, you, know, you know what the procedure is. It's where they squeeze your breast, take some x-rays. It's a crude procedure, by the way. Uh, it was, so when I was a medical student, it was first introduced by Wolf. I saw some of the first mammograms ever done and we thought they were pretty crude then. They haven't changed much. They're still crude. And uh, what they do is they, they, um, they the, the, the jaws of this machine squeeze your breast and about a third of the women say they'll never have this done again. If you happen to have a positive finding on a mammogram and later on, you're told that it was uh, a false positive, everything's okay. You know, half the women still worry about being sick three to six months after being reassured that they don't have cancer. It does a tremendous amount of destruction. How much good does it do? Well, let's take a look at the Cochrane collaboration. Cochrane collaboration is uh, an, a supposedly unbiased group of scientists and interested citizens. They're in well over 100 countries around the world, 40,000 volunteers. And they write papers that help me as a doctor understand what the science says. You know, I, I read a lot, I enjoy the scientific literature, but I don't have time to really read everything. And so they take experts in various fields, all the way from he treating head lice to treating breast cancer, and they review the scientific literature and came to come to conclusions. That's the Cochrane collaboration, and they publish papers in the Cochrane Library. You can 
you can believe these papers. Uh, almost all of them I agree with. Uh, the head of the Cochrane Collaboration was Peter Gertzky. He's a, a, a friend of mine. And uh, he served for 23 years as the head of the uh, Cochrane Collaboration. He published a book called, called Mammography Screening, Truth, Lies, and Controversies. You can get this book on Amazon. I encourage you to get it if you need to convince a, uh, a knowledgeable friend, physician, et cetera, about your position on mammograms. As far as a good read, it's not a good read. I mean, I asked Peter one time if he wrote his own books and he said, yeah. And I should have told him, well, I can believe it. But because, you know, they're really, really technical, really difficult to get through. But, you know, I lived this research. So to me, it was very interesting and very relevant. So you might want to get this book. A doctor insists that you have a mammogram. You say, read this. And then you tell me I need a mammogram. Anyway, the conclusion of the Cochrane collaboration is, uh, is routine mammograms, you know, every couple of years, do not save lives. And they increase, increase the number of women overdiagnosed. Overdiagnosed is a big problem. And they increase the number of women who are having mastectomies. After all, if you go look for a problem, you find it, and of course you have to treat it then, right? Well, they put out a brochure in 2012 that was uh, in 13 different languages, which told women not to have mammograms. And uh, this is what the Cochrane uh, Review says. It says that uh, if 2,000 women are screened regularly for 10 years, one will benefit from not dying. One out of 2,000. And of course, you're, if you're that one out of 2,000, you go, whoa, that's worth it. But we got to talk about everybody who goes through this. Uh, at the same time, 10 and as many as 50 healthy women uh, become cancer patients and will be treated unnecessarily. They're overdiagnosed. They would have never died of their cancer. It was either too slow growing or a false diagnosis. So you have made 10 to 50 women breast cancer victims. And no longer do they say, hi, Marge. They look at you, oh, breast cancer. What you doing today, Marge? can't get health insurance, you can't look at life insurance. You live under this cloud of, of thinking you're gonna die. Oh, and if I'd only gotten the mammogram earlier, I'd have been okay, right, guilt. And uh, uh, if you do 2000 mammograms, uh, somewhere between two and 600 women will be required to go through further testing and treatment. Yeah. And their conclusion is it's therefore no longer seems reasonable to attend for breast cancer screening. Okay, does your doctor know this? No, your doctor doesn't know this. Let me explain this to you. Of course, when I say this, you know that I'm generalizing. There's some doctors who are well-informed and really stand by their patients, but I, most of my colleagues are, are practicing medicine based upon, based upon incorrect information. And they don't take the trouble to find out what the correct information is. Let's take a look at a study that was published. And there are two studies so, so that were done. The other one's showing the same thing. Uh, they wanted to find out what the physician's knowledge was concerning mammograms. You know, what, what do they think about them? And uh, so they went and looked, uh, they, they went and talked about, to um, general doctors, uh, family practice doctors, internists, et cetera. And uh, <clears throat> they asked him, what do you think the benefit of a mammogram is? And they said, improve survival. Okay, they said improve, you'll live longer from the time of diagnosis, improve survival. And uh, they also said, you'll find more breast cancers and that's good for a patient. But, but the truth is, is that a uh, few of the doctors recognized that only randomized controlled trials showing an improvement in survival for the screen group is evidence that it works. Let me go through this in a little detail with you. Okay. Finding the tumor early. Here's the day of death. It's listed there as a zero. If you're not doing screening and you just casually do examinations, eh, you may find the tumor when it's a little larger, say three years before diagnosis. If you're going through extensive um, breast examinations, you know, checking your breasts every hour, every day, 
know, doing mammograms, et cetera. Uh, and you find it, say, seven years before you died. Yes, you lived longer from the day of diagnosis, but you didn't live any longer, period. You just lived longer knowing you were sick. You, you just lived longer knowing that, uh, you know, b- being a customer of the medical business. You died the same day. Early detection just finds the tumors earlier. But you know that's true because of the mechanism I just explained to you. By the time a tumor is found, it's 10 years old. Or by a mammogram, it's 14 to 17 years it's been growing. Okay, so uh, early detection is a fallacy. It just means you found the disease earlier, that's all. Oh, and by the way, they used to say that if you lived five years, you were cured. Well, you can see what nonsense that particular message is. Uh, the other thing that do- doctor said is you find more tumors, that's good. You increase detection. Well, <laughs> if you uh, look for tumors uh, while well, you're still alive and you find a whole bunch of tumors and, and what happens is you take these tumors out and that's all interesting. But if you compare the tumors of a woman who didn't go through this type of examination In other words, she didn't do early detection. She didn't have a whole bunch of biopsies done. And you add the tumors up, you find out that they're the same number of tumors in a woman who didn't have early detection. And those women who found tumors earlier, in other words, they found tumors while the patient was alive. Doesn't change the day of death. As uh, they said in this, the only way that you can really establish whether or not these early detection techniques work, and I'll tell you, as far as I know, and I'm, I'm pretty, pretty up to date on this, there are no early detection methods that result in improvement in survival, okay? So here you take a large, let's just test mammography breast cancer. Here you take a large number of women you divide them into two groups. One you do a whole bunch of mammograms on, uh, the other you don't. The ones you do the screening on, you ought to, at the end of period of time, study. You ought to be finding more women alive, and you don't. These are called randomized clinical trials, and they all show the same thing. Early detection for all the cancers I'm aware of does not improve survival. Well, there are a couple of, a couple of minor exceptions, but certainly all large tumors. Breast self-examination is harmful. Don't do it. That's me talking to you. No, that's not me talking to you. That's the Canadian Task Force on Preventative Healthcare. In 2001, they told Canadian citizens, don't touch your breasts. The American Cancer Society finally came around uh, with uh, the US Preventative Services Task Force statements and they said they shouldn't be teaching, doctors should not be teaching women to do breast self-examinations. Why? Well, because you find problems. And the result is you, 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 go, you go for tests and treatments that hurt you right there, but, but, but found evidence of increased harm from benign biopsies. You, you better be sure that you're looking for something that you can change, you can make a difference in, and you can't. And if you understood the natural history of cancer, of breast cancer, then you understand why this has to be so. So how do you find a suspicious mass? How about when you take a shower? I mean, that could be once a week or once a month. That's good enough. How about when you take a shower? Rather than fixating your whole life on checking your breasts and being afraid of having guilt, which is what, what, what happens with women. They, they, they feel this, this obligation to make sure that they catch it early enough and they can't. So what are you looking for? Well, cancers, they're, they're usually hard and irregular and they're fixated to surrounding tissues. A lump, you know, like a, a, a fibrocyst or, or a, a fibroadenoma, they're usually smooth and easy to move and sometimes painful. But you only make the diagnosis of uh, cancer under the microscope by an experienced pathologist. So that's the amount of effort you should be put into into early detection. When you take a shower, 
don't ruin your life over it. All right, so if you find a lump and say it's cancer, and again, this is discussed in a book that's available for you for free, no gimmicks. Along with the McDougal program for women, I believe Heather put that up. Written in 1985, good grief. Well, the truth don't change. Anyway, you can have a biopsy. Uh, you can have a lumpectomy. You can have a segmental mastectomy. We're, we're increasing the amount of, uh, of, of good tissue that's taken. You can have a, a simple mastectomy, <clears throat> removal of the entire breast. But when I first started practicing uh, medicine back in, uh, in the early 70s, 1980s, the standard treatment was a radical mastectomy. They, they took the breast, the lymph nodes on the affected side and the muscles on the chest wall, mutilating, you know, destroyed women's personal appearance and their lives. Anyway. So the difference being a lumpectomy, you just take the lump out, all right? And it can be relatively non-deforming. Uh, it's important that you get uh, clear margins. And that can be determined uh, at the time of surgery that the doctor makes sure that that he, he or she got all the tumor and there wasn't residual left in the breast. Not that it will uh, reduce your chances or increase your chances of dying if it leaves a little bit of extra tumor in the breast. It just becomes another problem we'll talk about in a second. So you do a lumpectomy and the argument is that if you just do a lumpectomy that you'll have an increased risk of local occurrence. Well, not if you do a lumpectomy with, with clear margins, you don't. And so without the, uh, the criteria that you, the criterion that you, uh, you have clear margins. I mean, just looking at uh, random lumpectomies, the, the chance of the tumor reoccurring in the breast is about 30 to 40%. The chance of it recurring in, on the chest wall after a mastectomy is about 10%. And if you add radiation, the chance of the tumor occurring on the chest wall is again, about 10%, okay? What we're talking about is local disease, controlling local disease. And if you remember the discussion we had at the beginning of this, you realize that we're not dealing with just local disease. We're dealing with systemic disease. In other words, disease that spread throughout the rest of the body. Uh, a mastectomy, they take the tumor, the breast, the, as I told you, a radical. They take the, uh, the muscles underneath and the lymph nodes. All right, Bar Bernard Fisher, one of my heroes. Uh, he did uh, the most important studies on breast cancer that have ever done or ever will be done. Uh, they did a, a study back in the 1970s, so uh, finished in the 1980s on uh, comparisons of uh, various kinds of surgical treatments. And I want you to notice that uh, the things that they looked at were total mastectomy, lumpectomy, and lumpectomy plus radiation. Please take a look at this in the bottom left-hand corner. And what you see is there's no difference in survival among the treatment groups. Do you see that? We've known that for 45 years. Okay, so let's go over this one more time. The chances of surviving are the same if you have the entire breast removed, including the muscles and the lymph nodes, compared to just taking the lump out, no radiation, we're not talking about any radiation added, and taking the lump out and adding radiation. All right, the effect of radiation after mastectomy and axillary surgery, uh, 10 year recurrence and 20 year breast cancer mortality. After 20 years, radiotherapy was not associated with improved overall survival. If you wanna read you know, the various studies, uh, uh, if you go to my September, 2017 newsletter, there's a thorough discussion about the effects of radiotherapy. And again, if you recall the natural history I gave you of this disease, wh why would radiating the chest wall cause you to live longer. The, the tumor is already in every, every part of the body. Doesn't make sense. Why, why would more extensive surgery make a difference? And when you die, it makes no sense if you understand the natural history. 
that you don't want to leave a breast cancer untreated. I've seen about eight women in my career who have decided not to have the tumor removed. And I have evidence that says they would live longer than women who had the tumor removed. It certainly doesn't shorten your lifespan by leaving the tumor. It's just an ugly mess. You know, it's like taking care of a piece of hamburger on your chest wall. Why put a woman through that? So you need to control local disease. And that's why I recommend a lumpectomy with, uh, with margins free of cancer cells. That's, that's my treatment of choice. It's been my treatment of choice for half a century. It was used to be the treatment of choice at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Barney Cryle used to be a strong advocate of just doing lumpectomies. So um, you, you wanna make sure that you don't have this kind of an outcome. And not that it'll affect the day you die, but it'll affect your life significantly. And radiation can be delivered or more surgery can be had if the tumor comes back and you get the same results as far as how long you're gonna live. You know, in other words, the radio, radiotherapists and surgeons are really good at controlling local disease. So, so why, why, why treat, even if it was 30% of women got, got recurrences in their breasts who had a lumpectomy, why treat 100% of women with these aggressive therapies when only 30% would need it? 60% didn't save the quiver, save the arrow in the quiver for those who need it. All right. Uh, chances of living longer. I'll tell you what affects your, your, your length of survival. The things that suppress the immune system, major surgery, you know, big surgery will suppress your immune system. Blood transfusions, as a matter of fact, when, when uh, doctors started first dealing with kidney transplants, what they discovered is uh, those patients who had blood transfusions at the time of the kidney transplant, it suppressed their immune system. And, and they retained the kidneys longer. So blood transfusions, uh, radiation, chemotherapy, uh, lymph node irradiation, uh, lymph node removal. These things should not be done routinely. No, no scientific reason to do it. Again, I just recommend a lumpectomy with clear margins. All right, how about uh, toxic chemo regimes and estrogen suppression? Remember, this is a systemic disease. It's throughout the entire body, which by the way, you're going to control by being a healthy person. You're gonna end up living a long time. This is, this is not gloom and doom, but you need to know so you can take proper actions. You don't wanna do things that harm you just for the sake of doing things. More aggressive is not better. So Doctors realized this. They, they realized that they were and back in the late 70s. In fact, they realized it in 1951. They realized that they were dealing with a disease that had already spread throughout the rest of the body and, and no local therapy would ever help as far as improving overall survival. And so we developed uh, ways of going out and getting the cells that had spread throughout the rest of the body. And that being uh, cancer chemotherapies, toxic chem cancer chemotherapies. and and also estrogen suppression regimes. regimes. Okay, uh, you can reduce overall mortality by reducing estrogens. Remember, estrogen promotes the growth of breast cancer and increases your risk of dying. Anything you do to block the estrogens is gonna make a difference in your chances of survival. You could take pills like tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. And by the way, there's a, I discovered a natural, a whole bunch of natural supplements that are aromatase inhibitors. And there's evidence that these work too. I don't, never used them, but I thought I'd bring it to your attention. So these uh, suppress the activity of estrogen on your cells. That's one way to do it. Uh, the, the, the side effects of these are, you have an increased risk of uterine cancer because not only do they have an anti-estrogen effect, tamoxifen in particular, but they have an estrogen stimulating effect. So you have an increased risk of uterine cancer. You also have an increased risk of osteoporosis by uh, taking these pills. And, and you go through menopause. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the hot flashes start early. Uh, there are other ways to reduce uh, estrogen stimulation of the body and the cancer cells. And what I recommend is removal of the ovaries uh, through a simple laparoscopy procedure. Now, I know for a lot of women, they don't want to do that and they were going to take the pills. And I think that's okay. I think it's worth your while to do. I do, I, do, I recommend it. 
But if you want to get on with your life, because you're going to live a long time, that's the thing you've got to start thinking is I'm going to live a long time. And so these decisions I'm making now are going to affect me for decades. That's why you've got to slow down. You can't be rushed. You've got to learn. You've got to understand what's going on so you can make the right decisions. Now, the other way that you can knock out the ovaries is by cancer chemotherapy. Cancer chemotherapy, that's how it works. Yeah, the, 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 the more common cancer the, the chemotherapies, they, they cause chemical castration, you know, at a price, not just a financial price, but a woman loses her hair and throws up for a year. That's cruel. Uh, let's take a look at a review of polychemotherapy on randomized trials. And these trials show you just what I explained to you. There is a, a 10 year survival improvement of 11 to seven, per, excuse me, of seven to 11% for women under 50 who have ovary function. In other words, you deprive them of estrogens by the chemotherapy. But women who are postmenopausal, in other words, they always have already shut down, you only have a two to 3% improvement in survival. And, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, you're, you're, you're gonna, if you get involved in the medical business, you're gonna be fooled by a whole bunch of terminology. You know, they talk about disease-free survival. Well, you know what? If you suppress the disease, uh, you won't see it. So you have disease-free survival. The only thing you're interested in is overall mortality. Don't, don't put any other card. You just care about, okay, I'm going to choose this therapy over not choosing it or another therapy. How long will I live? It's the only card on the table. And so you want randomized controlled trials that look at overall survival. Nothing to brag about when it comes to toxic chemotherapy. All it does is cause chemical castration. Again, there's a much more humane way to castrate a woman. So uh, you end up depriving the body of estrogens through various mechanisms. Now you're dealing with the fact that uh, the bones Strength of the bones is determined by estrogens. And when you deprive the, the body of estrogens, you increase the risk of getting osteoporosis. So what do you do? Well, the, the basic things that you do are eat a low protein diet because high protein causes uh, the body to lose its bones, it causes osteoporosis, particularly animal foods. And I'm talking about you know, beef and fish and cheese. In fact, cheese is the most uh, acidic of all foods that we eat. So you eat this acid food and the bones dissolve to release alkaline material to neutralize the acid so you don't die from all this acid you eat. And the, 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 the bone material ends up in the, in, the, in the kidney system where it forms kidney stones. And you essentially pee your bones into the toilet. So to preserve your bones, what you need to do is a low protein diet and you know, sweet potatoes would be a great, great food to eat. Sunshine, very important for the health of the bones. You need to have sunshine. It's absolutely crucial. And then exercise. These are first line therapies. Now to preserve bone health, there are second line therapies that I'd like you to consider. Uh, one is uh, to take an antacid. To neutralize the dietary acids you consumed in the form of beef and chicken and fish and cheese. If you take an antacid, any kind of antacid, it doesn't have to be Tums that's calcium carbonate, it can be sodium bicarbonate, it can be potassium hydroxide, it doesn't make any difference. It's just an antacid. It, it neutralizes your metabolic and dietary acids at not much of a price. You know, a couple of wafers a day, a thousand milligrams a day, that's what you do. Now, these are only, I may make these recommendations only for women who have a high risk of osteoporosis. And this would be perfectly fine for a woman who uh, had had uh, deprivation of estrogens caused by the various things that we talked about a couple of slides ago. Uh, progesterone cream is supposed to be, well, it's an, progesterone is anti-estrogen. And there's evidence that progesterone cream causes the bones to strengthen. I don't know that it, 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 it's that good of an evidence, but I don't think it does any harm. And you can buy estrogen creams over the counter in your natural food store or it could be prescribed by your doctor. Now, if you didn't have breast cancer, I would prescribe estrogen as a skin cream. 
And that, that's discussed in the book, The McDougall Program for Women, which again is offered to you for free on our website. So I prescribe uh, skin creams that contain estrogen and progesterone. That's the way that I deal with women who are high, high risk of fractures. You know, not, not the average person who flunks a bone mineral density test. You know, somebody who's already had some fractures due to non-traumatic events. Then, then I go to the next regime like antacids and, and estrogen and progesterones, but not estrogens when you're dealing with breast cancer. Remember, estrogen promotes cancer. So, you know, the facts are the facts. They haven't changed in 50 years, probably 70 years. But we're still practicing archaic medicine, inhumane medicine. Of course, what do you expect from a male-dominated medical business taking care of women? When a woman buys into the message from, you know, the standard American Cancer Society, well, they're improving. You know, standard recommendations out there. Uh, <clears throat> what, what does she get? You know, maybe, maybe let's just give them a, a, her a few extra days of life. But what does she have to do for that? She has to have annual mammograms, or maybe maybe every two years. She has to do uh, breast self examinations. You know, maybe even daily. Certainly every week, women are frightened into doing them. She has to uh, go into a male doctor's office, and you know, I know there are many female doctors out there, but, but but you know, it's usually been a male doctor's office, and take off her shirt and expose herself and let the doctor examine her. She's willing to do that for maybe a few extra days of life. She's willing to undergo biopsies, mastectomies, radiation, ovary removal, anti-estrogen drugs, and polychemotherapy. But what I hear from my colleagues and many other people is it's too much to ask them to change their diet when that's the thing that works. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the food. You know, if you want to have a good life, a long life, even when things are so desperate. I, you know, I have women in my practice, the scientific literature talks about women who've had cancer spread throughout their entire body who have recovered. They've had spontaneous remissions. Don't ever give up. And the kind of diet you need to eat is the diet that is associated with the lowest chance of getting breast cancer the lowest chance of having these poisonous chemicals in the food. The, the be best chance of having a healthy immune system. That's a starch-based diet with the addition of fruits and vegetables. And we've been teaching that for, well, since 1977. Still teaching it today. I hope uh, that my presentation was understandable. If not, you can read the books or you can watch the show again. But this is what I want, always wanted to tell you if you were my patient for breast cancer. Yeah, I want to sit down and look you right in the eye and say, this is the truth. You know, once you know the truth then you can go out and you can make decisions, you're going to get a lot of different messages. Uh, but I would ask you to challenge your doctors. Say, hey, what about this point of view? What, what about this research? I've showed you the scientific studies. No. Question these people. You know, when you buy a car, you question the car salesman, don't you? You know, you're, you're buying a, a type of, of product that could change, will change your life. You, you need to ask questions and please don't rush. This is a 10 year old disease by the time you find it. You've got, you got days, weeks, months to understand what the truth is. And I put that all together for you in two books, McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion and the McDougall Program for Women, which you know, we'd like you to have. But not only would we like you to have, we'd like to give, it, you know, to give it all your friends and relatives and your doctors and your dietitians. It's free, no gimmicks. And I've written a couple of newsletters and the most important one is September 2017 newsletter, which talks about the fact that the treatment for breast cancer is barbaric, brutal and barbaric, but it exists. And you know what? I don't know if it's getting any better. All right, AJ. That was fantastic, Dr. McDougall. When you said you published research in 1984, you actually did the study at your clinic? 
I did the study when I was in Honolulu. When I was in Honolulu, I had a radio show and I recruited women with breast cancer. Ruth Heidrich was one of them. Do you know Ruth? Yeah, she's been on the show. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, Ruth, Ruth has an interesting story. Anyway, I recruited these women with breast cancer and I changed their diet and I changed the prognostic factors as far as their chances of survival. Overweight women die quicker. Women with the high estrogen levels die quicker. High prolactin levels die quicker. Higher cholesterol levels, they die quicker. Why? Because it all reflects their eating patterns. Anyway, I, uh, I met Ruth Heidrich back in oh, probably 1987. No, I had to meet her before that, but uh, <clears throat> she came to my office. That was 1977. Yeah, she came to my office and uh, she says, I got good news and bad news. The good news is I got rid of a bad husband after 12 years. The bad news is I've got cancer every place. And I said, you know, Ruth, I said, I, I really don't know what to do, but I've been reading a whole bunch of stuff that I would make available for you. She sat in my office for two days and she went through the papers that I pulled from the scientific literature that showed how, how you get, showed the things I just told you. This is old information. She's been around forever. Your doctor should know it. Anyway, uh, Ruth uh, had uh, metastatic cancer all over her body. In fact, I just talked to Ruth the day before yesterday and uh, she's doing well. She's in her mid eighties and she's one a thousand triathlons and marathons since we met. Anyway, she's one example. And I have many, many examples of patients that, uh, that have done extremely well. But the most important thing is that you do no harm. Food does no harm. It costs nothing. You should do it for all kinds of reasons, including a good bowel movement. You know, recommending these, these, uh, these therapies that mutilate you and make you sick you gotta be careful. You know, you gotta make sure that the good outweighs the bad. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, the scientific data questions this, even though that's the usual doctrine out there to get all these kinds of therapies I talked to you about. This is, a, this is routine. Don't you dare question it, this is routine. Well, it's wrong. I've known it's been wrong. I've written about it being wrong. And, uh, and uh, you can find out whether I'm right or wrong by simply reading the things that I've written. And I've uh, heavily referenced my writing with uh, scientific research. You can go read the original papers. I really, I really don't know. You know, when I get into a discussion with my colleagues, say an oncologist, I've had many discussions with oncologists, particularly when I was in Hawaii. I'd sit down with these experts, like the, the head of the Hawaii Cancer Society. And 10 minutes into our conversation, he'd say to me, you know as much about this disease as I do. I'd say, of course I do. Why do you think I agreed to talk to you? <laughs> you know, you can, you can know as much as your doctor does. And really, you, I need to take the trouble. This is your life. You know, I, I've, made, I've made the science available to you in such an easy format, easy to understand. Now, if you don't take the trouble to read a couple chapters in the books that I've written, which I've given you for free, and read the newsletters, which you can have for free. Well, you're not trying. Somebody's, somebody's really it caused you to give up. Don't give up. You know, you have a life to live. You have a, a good life to live. And it, it depends upon the choices you make. Now, I'm here to tell you that the right choice is fix the food. Dr. McDougall, there's a lot of questions, so I don't know if you only want to take ones on the top. Yeah, I, 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 I love to, you know, I really hope I stimulated you to learn, you know, to understand the things I've understood for 45 years and been so frustrated to see people hurt unnecessarily for money. So yeah, I'd love to answer your question. I want to make sure that I was clear. I want to make sure that you understand why why early detection doesn't work. It's late, eight late detection. I want you to understand why aggressive treatment of the local disease, in other words, what's on the chest wall, doesn't make any difference in survival. I want you to understand systemic therapy. Yes, you need systemic therapy. And by the way, there are some isolated uh, uh, types of cancer out there that are subtyped 
which may respond better to, to chemotherapy than the general regime of chemotherapy that's given to almost all patients. There's some, there's some, you know, there are, uh, there, there are uh, several other regimes out there that do, you want to look at. You, know, you go to the doctor, you say, okay, doctor, this is what you recommend. You know, tell me the protocol. Give me the scientific data that supports your point of view. And then you go home and you uh, get on the computer and you go to the National Library of Medicine or just Google and put in the studies that the doctor suggested that you uh, read to support his or her therapy. Usually these studies will tell you the other point of view and start doing some research. Start, start always look for overall survival, not disease-free survival, overall survival. Yes, you may, you may have less chance of dying of breast cancer, but you're gonna die from the surgery and the chemotherapy and all the other things. And the end result is you have the same risk of dying. So you always have to look for overall survival. You wanna look for randomized control trials. You need to do this. I mean, what's more important than you, your, your, your spouse, your child, your mother? Take the trouble. It's not, it won't take you long to become an expert. I bet, I bet in a week, most of you can walk into your doctor's office and the doctor will say to you, you know, you know as much about this disease as I do. You go, of course, doctor, I got it. Well, why wouldn't I know most about it? So let's have some questions. You know, it's it's unfortunate because by like you said, by the time it's it's detected, it's been in the body for 10 years or more. And even when people change their diet, it you know, they get they get frustrated that well, I, I changed my diet and I still got cancer. Well, it's because it started seven years before when they were eating at Burger King or 10 years before. You know, there, there's good evidence that uh, the in, initiation of breast cancer occurs during adolescence. So it occurred a long time, a long time ago. And, but, but the thing is, is that the body is always trying to heal. If you look at breast cancer specimens, you'll find uh, immune cells attacking the tumor. The body never, it never stops trying to heal. It always wants to survive. That's a basic rule. And if you take the attitude that your, your body is incapable of, of staying alive, you're finished. You know, if you take the attitude, the only way you're going to beat this is uh, from outside help, you're finished. So, uh, you, know, uh, you know, there are people who say that everybody has cancer cells in their body. Well, everybody doesn't die of cancer. Uh, if you look at, um, if you look at the breasts of women in their 40s, it's a random tests of women in their 40s, you find uh, various, uh, various stages of breast cancer in essentially all women. That reference, by the way, is in the book, McDougall's Medicine of Challenge and Second Opinion. You find all the way from uh, early transitions to frank cancer and essentially 100% of women. Uh, certainly you always find it in the other breast. This is another dichotomy of worry that, that, that's always troubled me. Is uh, you know, when you have a breast cancer, say in your right or left breast, the doctor just takes off one breast. This is a disease of all breast tissue why not do bilateral mastectomies routinely? Because nobody would come to your doorstep, doctor. You know, they recognize that as aggressive and brutal, but you can get away with taking one breast, help yourself. Anyway, so what I'm saying is, hey, you know, we've done a lot of things unhealthy to us and diet's not gonna fix everything, but it's gonna make the major difference as far as your health goes in your future. And uh, costs nothing, no side effects, gives you a good poop, makes your breath smell better, takes care of your oily skin, makes you a better lover. <laughs> is there something particularly deleterious in the standard American diet that is causing the cancer? Is it the dairy? Is it alcohol? Is it all of the above? I, I think that, uh, you know, I told you how you get these chemicals in your body. The chemicals that come from industrial pollutants. And I showed you how you, when you eat high on the food chain, you get high, very high concentrations of the chemicals. So I think they're the initiators and also they're promoters of cancer. The other thing is estrogen promotes cancer. And so once you get the cancer, what happens is if you have high estrogen levels, which you'll have if you eat the high fat American diet, 50% greater estrogen levels than women who eat like we do, then you're gonna promote the cancer. You're gonna hurry up your day of death. Oh, so that's what it is. It's not heredity. 
Uh, you know, you might have a hereditary tendency, but it's not hereditary. You know, post-World War II, there was no, no breast cancer in Japan. I've actually uh, been in touch with, uh, several years ago, a uh, breast cancer survivors group in, uh, in Japan. And they use a lot of my material. And uh, you know, these, these women are old enough to remember post-World War II, there was no breast cancer. Now, of course, it's becoming quite common because the, the, the adoption of the Western diet. So uh, w women who, who uh, have no ovary function you know, for various reasons, either were born without ovaries or they were removed when they were very young, they don't, they don't ever get breast cancer. This is an estrogen dependent disease. And we talked about last time about various mechanisms that the, that the food causes the estrogens to go up. You know, they, they shoot the cows and pigs and chickens with hormones, and that's one way. And, and then there, you grow bacteria in your, in your colon that convert uh, food substances into estrogens. And the, the fiber and the plant parts, uh, they, they actually they, they block the activity of estrogens. Uh, being overweight, you have more estrogen. The fat cells in your body actually convert male hormones that are produced in the adrenal glands into estrogen, estrone. So the fatter you are, the more overweight you are, the quicker you'll die, the more likely you'll get breast cancer. So I, I wouldn't want you to focus just on that. It goes one step back. You must look at the common denominator. You know, it's the food. The food makes you overweight. Food raises your estrogen levels. The food raises your prolactin levels. The food raises your cholesterol. You know, it spoils your immune system. It's the food. You know, you can lose weight on the Atkins diet and you'll end up, uh, as far as I understand, you'll end up dying quicker of breast cancer. You'll be thin, but you'll, you'll shorten your life. Those, yeah, I, was, I can say that. My February 2015 newsletter says it, based upon the American Cancer Society's uh, findings and conclusions is that if you eat this kind of low carb, high protein, high fat diet as recommended by well, too many people these days, that you're going to be harmed. And by the way, if you go to that February 2015 newsletter, uh, you'll click on various studies showing that if you eat well, you'll live longer. The evidence is overwhelming, but it doesn't, it doesn't create any money. So no reason to tell you. It not, not, doesn't fit into the profit scheme, ladies and gentlemen. Why do they tell women with breast cancer not to drink alcohol? I mean, I don't think anybody should drink alcohol, but why is there a connection there? Well, uh, alcohol suppresses the immune system. Uh, alcohol uh, makes it more likely for you to be overweight. I don't, I don't know of any real toxic effect of alcohol. I mean, it's, there's a lot of toxic effects. It's a very dangerous drug, but uh, alcohol does not make you overweight itself. Uh, the alcohol molecule is not turned into a fat molecule with any efficiency at all. But what alcohol does is it relieves, relieves your inhibitions. So instead of one potato chip, you have three bags of potato chips. Uh, uh, that, that's how alcohol hurts a lot of people. It's, uh, you, just, you just stop sensible behavior. Yeah. I mean, by the way, well, we're talking about alcohol. We're talking about people falling down and bumping themselves. One of the things that many women believe or believed is that you get breast cancer by, by injury to the breast, by say somebody bumping your breast. That's not how you get breast cancer. You also ought to know that, that uh, these prophylactic mastectomies where they take off your breasts early in life, you still can get breast cancer because they can't get all the, all the breast tissue. And in BRCA, the BRCA gene uh, issues, BRCA1 and BRCA2, which are women who have very aggressive ovary and breast cancer, what they find is that removing the breast does not prolong survival, but removing the ovaries does. Why? Because you reduce the estrogen stimulation. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, a woman with, uh, with the BRCA gene, she should have the lump removed. In other words, uh, non-deforming surgery and she should have her ovaries taken out. Great, thanks Dr. McDougall. Here's a question that was sent in from Bonnie. Could you please ask Dr. McDougall his thoughts on tamoxifen? I had a lumpectomy and radiation, no chemo. My cancer was estrogen positive. I've just started taking it, but I hate being on it for five years. Right, well, I, I, I routinely 
uh, offer tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors to women as, as part of their therapy. <clears throat> uh, the Susan B. Corman website has a really good section on what the benefits will be from taking tamoxifen for five years. And uh, they're not a lot, but it is some uh, improvement survival. So I think you should consider, I think rather than taking the, um, the pills, which you know, cause hot flashes sometimes and increased uterine cancer and osteoporosis, uh, maybe you think about having a simple laparoscopy removal of the ovaries. You know, most of the women we're talking about are past the reproductive years. Not all, my sister-in-law wasn't. But, uh, you know, most women, they don't get it until they get older. Great, thanks. And somebody named Lynn's asking about hydroxychloroquine. What about, uh, that, that's, that's the drug to treat COVID, right? I'm oh, just, okay. So maybe it wasn't related to best breast. You know, th this, is, this gets into a whole other subject. No, I do not recommend hydroxychloroquine. No, 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 no. I'm just a regular old country doctor. I don't do that. Right. Okay. So let's see. Now, now do the questions that were sent in, do you want them only on breast cancer? Because they, they have them on a few other subjects. Let's, let's start with the breast cancer, if we could. I'm going through them right now. Uh, but uh, There's lots of questions. They're just not all on breast cancer. And, and my chat goes very, very fast. We'll, 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 get, we'll get Mary in here and I'll answer the general questions for you whenever you want. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's essential that you understand the natural history of this disease. Then everything makes sense. You know what to do. You slow the doubling times. You know, if it's truly cancer, you've already got a systemic disease. A lot of what's diagnosed as cancer really isn't cancer. You know, it just kind of looks like cancer, but it doesn't act like cancer. So uh, that's where you overdiagnose. And of course, you live with the, the stigma of having cancer once you have this, this kind of investigation done. You're, all, you're, you're thought of as a cancer victim from that day on. You'd have never died of it. it would never have killed you. You died something else first. Overdiagnosis. And that happens a lot. Maybe, yeah. maybe, well, anyway, it happens a lot. Her. I found a cancer question from Pat. I did not submit a biopsy after mass was found in the right breast 10 years ago at 59. When I asked about the last mammogram 25 years ago, my doc said it was present, but small. I was never told. 30 years later, I'm reluctant to go for a biopsy. Both my breasts look uniform with the right a little smaller. I'm vegan 15 years, SOS free about two. I have 20 pounds to lose. I'm 39% body fat. Is it possible that I can save myself without biopsy and possible surgery? Well, if you have a lump, I, I told you you ought to remove it because you don't want to have it grow through the skin. You don't want to have this mess on your chest wall. So uh, if you think that it's a suspicious lump, in other words, it's growing, it's hard, it's fixed, they have it treated. So the local disease is not a big deal. You've got to separate local disease from systemic disease. So you know what to treat and how to treat it. You want to control local disease. You know, that's your goal. And the way to do it most simply is to do a lumpectomy with, with clear margins. If you don't have that luxury, then you didn't get clear margins or whatever, you have the option of not going doing any further, further treatment until it comes back. And if it comes back, then have further surgery or radiation at that time. There's no loss of life by delaying the treatment of localized disease. It's a 10 year old systemic disease. It's just make a lot of sense to you. you know, as I say, I, I used to have evidence uh, before it caught fire. I used to have uh, evidence that uh, talked about women who had untreated breast cancer and how their survivals were really good. Uh, it was a tough life. As I, as I say, I sat in my office and I watched about eight women walk through my office uh, showing pictures like I showed you of untreated breast cancer. It was, it was tough, but that was their choice. You know, they, they didn't want to have the therapy and, you know, they were told, of course, that, the, that they will die sooner and that it's stupid and they had caused a lot of guilt and they're uh, not true. Uh, but they suffered by having untreated breast cancer in their own way, but Decreasing the survival is not one of the consequences of untreated breast cancer. I know this is really upsetting you, but it's true. And I've told you why. 
and the evidence is there. You know, if, uh, if treating breast cancer worked, you'd see it in the scientific studies. I showed you Bernard Fisher's work, but no work done after that of, of any importance. He, he just settled it in the late 70s, early 80s. You know, I showed you the results of treating the breast with radiation and many other studies in my September 2017 newsletter. So, you know, the truth is there, it's not gonna change. If, if we were having wonderful success, we'd be hailing from the rooftops uh, how we're curing all this cancer, we're not. But, but, but you can prevent it. But if you get it, you can only take treatments that do you more good than harm. And you can fix the problem, which is the food. And, and do a few other estrogen depriving things and treat local disease. And it's really simple. The truth is simple. The truth is simple and easy to explain. I hope I explained it all to you. If not, I'll keep trying. But it's very clear in the books that I've written. So go to the website and get those books. It's all there, all the research, all the references. I'll tell you, if you can get your doctor to sit down and read what I've written, and you should, you should insist on it. You know, tell your doctor, I'll pay you $200 to read this book on my disease. That's cheap. Tell me why he's wrong. Tell me why he, well, tell me one word he said that's wrong. You know, show me a T he didn't cross. A sentence he didn't end with a period. You tell me. I was really fanatic. I was OCD when I came to writing these books because I knew they would stand the test of time. And I knew if I did it right the first time, I wouldn't have to apologize or change later on. You know, these are things that have been known for a long time. But breast cancer has been treated surgically uh, for probably 500 years. At the turn of the uh, 19th to 20th century, uh, the typical treatment for, uh, not typical, a a commonly practiced treatment for breast cancer was to remove the breast, the underlying muscles, and the arm on the affected side. And then we have uh, Halstead who came along in the 1920s who popularized the radical mastectomy. By 1951, we knew that it didn't improve survival. Fisher proved it, as I showed you. You know, local treatment does not cause you to live longer. Why? Because it's a systemic disease. Plan on it. Live that way. This is not all sad. I mean, you know, what's sad is to have you miss out on life. Uh, telling you the truth, actionable truth, is not sad. It should empower you. It's cheap, too. <laughs> Cost you nothing. Lori says, I'm curious as to how many women die from complications of the treatment versus the cancer itself. Thank you for sharing today, Dr. McDougall. Equal. In other words, if you look at the lives saved and Cochran said one in 2000 women had their life saved, then one in 2000 women would be killed by chemotherapy or the viral infections that follow it or, or on the operating table or the anesthesia associated with the operation. So, you know, there's no, no reduction in mortality. Uh, even though you may have, to have a less chance of dying of breast cancer, they'll kill you some other way. How often do women get breast cancer? One in seven women get breast cancer. How often do they die of it? Oh, much less. You know, they live longer. If you really have breast cancer, what's the chance of you dying of breast cancer? And I, you know, this is in the books. You can read it, you can read the research. I mean, women back in the 50s and 40s and so on, when you know, breast cancer really presented as a, a serious disease, not just a biopsy. The, the chances of dying of breast cancer was, were somewhere between 78 and 100% of eventually dying of the disease. So that's the, that's the long-term natural history. You can change that. I've told you, you can change that. Uh, you know, I published that in 1984 in the journal Breast. The American Cancer Society published it in February 13th, 2015. You can change the course of this disease by not throwing gasoline on the fire. Makes all the sense. Yep. Okay, so I'm waiting for a question that somebody has just emailed us. Here it is. So um, this is from, 
I can't pronounce the first name. I am at high risk and I'm only 45. I have so much fear that I'm taking necessary treatments currently on Neuralink. Will diet prevent this from metastasizing? It's so hard to believe when the doctors are constantly scaring you, but I wanna be realistic. Uh, fear, fear, fear and guilt. They're after you. Uh, I don't know what that particular uh, treatment is. So I'd hate to comment on it. Um, I, the, the, the food fixes, uh, fixes you so that you are a prime fighter for uh, anything that would do reduce your risk of surviving. The body wants to survive. It's natural. It's always healing, always. Now, there was a study published uh, in 2011 in Lancet Oncology where they, uh, they took a, a large group of women and uh, they divided them into two groups based upon their frequency of having mammograms done. And they followed them for six years. So they took one group that had a mammogram done initially and no more mammograms. And they took another group which had a mammogram done every two years for the six year period of time. Now you would expect that you'd have the same number of cancers in both groups, right? You know, they're randomized controlled groups. You'd expect the same number of cancers. But what they found is that those who had frequent mammograms had 22% more cancers and the conclusion of this article published in Lancet Oncology was that these tumors naturally regressed. You, they were they cured, the body cured itself. That's a, modern, that's, that's, a, that's a modern study that was actually cited by the US Preventative Services Task Force in one of their papers. So 22%, you know, that's pretty good. And women who didn't change their diet at all, I guess, they just, body just naturally killed off 22% of the tumors. Good deal. What if, what if you armed the body with a real fighting fuel, huh? What do you think would happen? And you want to use these the other therapies offered to you with the question, will this do me more good than harm? You got to ask that question. You got to ask your recommenders that question. If the doctor is recommending something to you, the doctor is a recommender. It is his or her obligation to prove it works. It's not my obligation to prove it doesn't. It's their obligation to prove it works. They're the ones that are recommending it. But I find myself in a defensive position. I've got to show you folks that it doesn't work. And believe me, there's no contesting out there. I've been talking this way for, for over 45 years. I actually, the story, one of the stories that I'd love to tell you someday, and I think I did on this, uh, on this forum with AJ is uh, how uh, in the early 1980s, I got the third informed consent law passed in the United States. Well, informed consent law requires uh, doctors to tell women that the consequences of, of treatment are essentially the same, just like I told you by law. 22 states now have informed consent laws, forcing physicians to tell their patients the truth. Why would you require laws to, act, to, to have doctors act responsibly? It's because doctors are people. And they do things that are not necessarily always right or truthful. People are asking about Premarin, HRT, how long it takes on a plant-based diet for the immune system to fight cancer, things like that. Fight, as soon as you shake the last bat, bite of garbage, you, you change things around. It happens quickly. So uh, as far as HRT goes, HRT promotes breast cancer but it also makes the bones stronger. It also makes your vaginal tissues uh, much, much more functional. So those women who decide that uh, after the, their time in life when they can have babies, decide that they're not gonna quit their sex life, they may need a little extra help with estrogens. And I prescribe estrogen topical creams for the vagina to, uh, to fool mother nature. In other words, there's no reason to have sex after menopause. <laughs> say <laughs> so so you know if you're going to fight nature, you might want to take a little risk and, and uh, topical creams uh they're not associated with increased risk of breast cancer they're using vaginal creams at least you know so far they're not associated and i uh i prescribe skin creams and in the mcdougall program for women which again is free i laid out a whole prescription you can bring it to your doctor and tell your doctor you want to be treated this way you don't go to a pharmacy that just takes 
bottles of big pills and put them in small bottles. That's what most pharmacies do. You need to go to a compounding pharmacy where uh, they actually make up these preparations as, as skin creams. Now, skin cream is so much more potent than a pill. But with pills, when you take pills, uh, estrogens, progesterones, testosterone, et cetera, there's something called first pass kinetics, where the pill in the stomach, the drainage of the stomach is directly to the liver. And the liver metabolizes these hormones and makes them weak. But when you put the hormone on your skin, it, uh, it affects the tissues, the bones, the skin, et cetera long before it goes to the liver. So it's like 10 times as potent. Skin creams are a big deal. They're, they're good. I, I prescribe, um, you know, but only for women who, menopause is normal and natural. You shouldn't be forced into thinking you have to somehow treat the disease of menopause. It's a normal, natural time in life. There's a time to stop having babies. And, uh, you know, in the human design, it's when you're 50. So you can live 20 more years to see your children grow up. So uh, if you're having problems with, uh, with this change in life, which is your last period, then uh, you, you take some extra treatment and hopefully you do more good than harm. You try a little vaginal cream to help with the uh, vaginal function. You uh, take a little skin cream to help you with hot flashes improve your feelings of well-being. That sounds reasonable. And uh, protect your bones. Estrogen builds bones, also promotes cancer. So one, one of, the, uh, one of the, the puzzles from many physicians, including scientists, is the finding that, that women who are overweight have less uh, osteoporosis, but they have more breast cancer. And the common denominator here is estrogen again. If you're overweight, you make estrogens in your body, which makes the bone stronger, but also increases your risk of breast and uterine cancer. So. Robin says, is there anything you can do for vaginal thinning and discomfort other than the estrogen cream? Uh, change your diet. I've had, I've had many, many women with dyspareunia uh, that's having trouble with sex, sexual intercourse. And uh, they have benefited tremendously by changing diet. I know she's going to come back and say she already eats good, but you know that that's all. That's the only tricks I have. And uh, using uh, using uh, you know natural lubricants, and then trying to build the tissues back with uh, estrogen. The the vaginal tissue goes from a tissue that's seven cells thick to a a, a, a tissue that's about one cell thick when you go through menopause. So you know naturally. You know, God says no reason to have intercourse because you can't have babies, which is, you know, one thing that some of us don't want to hear about. You know, I just had Dan Buettner on the show. I should have asked him if all these centenarians are still having sex. Yeah, I actually want to have uh, Dan Buettner on tomorrow on the show that I'm doing. What show do you do? Well, you know, we, we're building this new website, AJ, on uh, diet therapy for planet Earth. And so I'll be interviewing experts. And Dan Buettner just happens to be the first one I've done this year. I did 12 experts uh, last year, which are already up on, the, on both websites. The new website will be up in a month. So can uh, we see these interviews? Uh, yeah, you can, you can actually go to my website now, look under, uh, look under education or just put in Dan Buettner's name. And you can see you can see the ones I've done with them in the past, the, my advanced study weekends. And yes, uh, Heather will be sending out uh, the interview from our McDougal program website, and uh, so you all watch, you'll be able to watch it. And Maybe I'll, you can ask I'll, him what they're doing for vaginal dryness in the blue zones. I'll ask Dan Butner some tough questions, including the sex one. <laughs> Well, because he said on my show that alcohol is, uh, you know, really important for living longer, but all the doctors that I interviewed disagree. Uh, you know, alcohol is, uh, first of all, it's, it's in my, my opinion, a professional sin for a doctor to recommend alcohol to people. Because, you know, nine out of, out of 10 people, they drink it for relaxation and for enjoyment. But one out of 10 people that listens to your message about how good alcohol is for you is known as an alcoholic. And then they get in a car and they kill your family or they go home and they beat the family up. 
Alcohol is a very, very difficult substance and should never be re recommended by doctors. Uh, alcohol, however, is, you know, AJ, the, 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 first, the first people I've seen with clear arteries, you know, on autopsy, I did a lot of autopsies when I was a student. Uh, skid row bums, alcoholics, they had baby clean arteries. Why? Because they were consuming a no fat, no cholesterol food, alcohol. Uh, same thing would have happened with starvation, but, uh, you know, alcohol is a, a, not a good thing. I, I almost lost my job at St. Elena Hospital because of alcohol. St. Elena is in the Napa Valley. It's a Seventh-day Adventist hospital. And, uh, you know, part of my responsibility was giving some lectures. And I gave lectures to the the foundation, to the members of the foundation that they had. And, and uh, Mondavi, Robert Mondavi was uh, at one of the lectures. And I, I, I talked about, I said things like, you know, alcohol should not be recommended by doctors, et cetera. And, you know, Robert Mondavi got upset with me to say the least. And uh, went, went, actually went to the administration and, you know, there, of course, uh, Mondavi Weiner is the big, big funder of St. Helena Hospital. And, you know, I just, but I just wouldn't say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say what he wanted me to say, which is if you drink wine, you'll be healthier. You know, because, because that one person out of 10 that destroys everything in their path. Well, th that's what Dan said on my show last week, that people that drink alcohol live longer. Well, you know, fine, maybe they do, but, but the social consequence is huge. You know, people, why don't, you know, I, there, there, of course, is a little truth to that. And, you know, people love to hear good news about their bad habits. So uh, my guess is that uh, Dan Butner imbibes. I don't, but I have in the past. Yeah. Well, those are all the questions I see on cancer. We have other questions, but they're on other topics. I think we can get Mary over here. Yeah. Well, part of this new website involves, uh, it talks about, I don't talk about the McDougal diet or a vegan diet on the diet. The diet I propose to, to help salvage the planet, to slow down the warming of the planet. But the scientific studies, they often identify it as a vegan diet. And of course, I, I didn't want to use our name, even though I, I think the McDougal diet is you know, the perfect diet for this particular project, which is to say planet Earth. And instead of saying the McDougal diet or a vegan diet, what I do is I talk about a traditional diet. And I don't know whether you can see this or not. This is a, this is a coin. Here, three sisters. I don't know. I mean, this is the three sisters coin. They're dollars. I bought a whole bunch of them many years ago, and we lost those. And I finally found them on the website. You can order the three sisters. Three sisters is about the American Indian. I mean, what could be more traditional for Americans than Native Americans? And their three sisters are, are squash, beans, and corn. So that's what I want people to eat. I want you to eat what 99% of the people who have ever walked this earth have eaten. The, the rich American diet is just a blip in history. You know, the, the fact that so many people eat like kings and queens and aristocrats has only happened in the last 25, 50 years. You know, the other, the other 750,000 years that the human being has existed has been on starch-based diets, except for those people who lived in extremes of the environment, like the Inuit Eskimo. Neanderthals lived on starch-based diets. We know that. So uh, all you have to do is go back to the way that human, most human beings have eaten in the past. In fact, it should be a cultural thing. I, when I was in uh, Hawaii as a practicing doctor, I would often play the race card with my patients. They, they'd come and see me in you know, like Hawaiian, Hawaiians, Japanese and Chinese and Filipinos. And, you know, overweight, gout, diabetes, heart trouble, cancer, et cetera. And I try and convince them to change their diet and they just, you know, didn't want to listen. You know how the resistance is. And so I, I would say to them, I'd say, uh, you know, uh, how's grandma and grandpa? What are grandma and grandpa doing? Oh, they're doing so good. They're you know, thin and healthy and hardworking in their nineties. You know, what do they eat? Well, you know, Japanese, uh, they lived on rice and vegetables and my Hawaiians, they lived on taro and breadfruit and uh, et cetera. You know, they, they can see it in their own family. 
And I would, I would finally hit them with a race card and I'd say, well, look what the white, white man's diet's done to you. You know, there you go, it's ruined your whole family. And that's what happened. And they had to just to take one step back to, uh, to their mom and dad, their grandma and grandpa to see the truth. This is, everybody can see this. Just open your eyes. It's funny, Dr. McDougal, I just made a comment that only people that recommend alcohol are people that drink it. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, you know, uh, there was an article in the San Francisco Chronicle, front page article about, about uh, chocolate and how good chocolate was for you. It took up the whole front page. And uh, I, I knew that people really enjoyed that article. People love to have good news about their bad habits. Be careful. Yep, absolutely. Well, hi, Mary, by the way, and your tree looks beautiful. Oh, thanks. Very festive. Well, She's uh, good grief, yeah. Mary. <laughs> okay. I don't need to lose her now. <laughs> Move my chair. Uh, okay, that's better. I'll just move the camera. <laughs> you should have. Well, you're, you're, you're there now. Just say hello to the folks. Well, hello, everybody. They, we'd love to see you. Actually, you know, the, the, this one question that I, that I didn't get to last month, I bet Mary could answer, actually, because it's about, it's about the diet. Okay, well, give me a try. Okay, I think you could. This is from Andrew. And he said, oh, where did it go? I was wondering well, why if we stuff our face with bread and pasta, but don't any fat, don't add any fat, why it still makes us fat. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't, yeah. Well, you're, it seems you're, to you're, make you're, it you're fat. Cheating. You're cheating, you're <laughs> Look, look. look. I'm old enough to remember a time when in Asia, nobody was overweight. You know, there were 2 billion Asians. Before 1980, their diet was 90% white rice. No one was overweight except for some special groups like the sumo wrestlers who ate a special diet in Japan. Otherwise, you, you could see newsreels of 100,000 people in a town square in Vietnam or Thailand or China. And nobody was overweight. They had no diabetes. Breast cancer and prostate cancer were essentially unknown. You, you live, you, you've lived long enough to see this. It's right in front of your eyes. Rich foods make people sick. So, so somehow or other, the fat is getting into the, the bread and the pasta and the fat is what's making him fat. Or, or it's a highly, um, highly refined food. Oh, you should tell the story about uh, the bread experiment oh, okay. at Michigan State. Yeah, there, I, this is a study that probably some of you have heard about. Uh, I went to Michigan State University. That's where I got my education, both undergraduate and uh, medical school. And uh, that's where I had my stroke when I was 18 years old. Well, at that university, they did an experiment, possibly in the same dormitory I lived in, which was Snyder Hall. They uh, asked uh, overweight men to do just one thing moderately overweight women. And that was to add 12 slices of bread a day to their diet. It's published 1978 in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Uh, they, they didn't tell them to eat fewer hamburgers or less butter. They said, you got to eat these 12 slices of bread. They didn't even tell them what kind of bread they had to eat, except um, one, some of it had to be brown bread and some of it had to be white bread, but they didn't say you have well, to go out and find the healthiest bread you can no, find. No, no, it was just kind of brownish bread. Yeah. Yeah, some were fine. They kind of divided them in two groups. Well, at the end of uh, two months, those who uh, ate the white bread lost on average 14 pounds. And those who ate the brown bread lost on average 19 pounds. By simply displace, displacing fattening foods because they had to eat the bread. So what the bread provide? Well, there's no fat to wear. And uh, there's carbohydrate to shut off the hunger drive. The, the appetite is satisfied by carbohydrate. That, that's, where you, uh, that's where you get your satisfaction. That's where you know it's time to stop eating, was when you get enough carbohydrate. That's sugar, for, by the way, folks, in case you didn't know. We, we recommend sugar in the form of potatoes, rice, corn, beans, et cetera. And uh, also, uh, you know, it's less calorie dense, the, the breads are than say 
oil, a teaspoon of oil is like 135 calories. Just and, to play uh, devil's advocate, you know, and I, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I don't eat bread and pasta and I don't know if I could have achieved this weight eating that. Are some of us just more sensitive to the, like the refining of the flowers and things like that? Maybe so, maybe so. When I come home from windsurfing, I usually have a half a loaf or a loaf of bread because I can the calories. Um, yeah, there's something, I know you love to talk about it, AJ, and it's a book that I was forced to write. I love that book, McDougal. You know, my favorite book is McDougal's Pro from For Maximum Weight Loss, Then Digestive Tuna. Right. I always consider myself a doctor interested in treating the sickest of all patients. The sicker you are, the happier I am. And uh, after about 20 years, I got uh, talked into writing a weight loss book. And I know you love that book. And it's really an important book. It's still on the, uh, the top selling list of Penwood Putnam. It's called the McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss. And it's about how to lose weight and why. It was an important book, uh, but I never, I never visualized myself as a, as a diet doctor. Wow. Well, you're a great doctor, whatever kind. So Daisy writes in, uh, Dr. McDougall is a clinician who's cared for vegans for many years. What is your experience with long-term vegans that did not eat junk and ate a low fat diet who still developed cancer? Are, more, are there more common types of malignancies and what have the outcomes been in your experience? Well, I don't think I have a big enough population to really come to any conclusions, but I can talk from the point of view of, uh, of geography, of, of world history. <clears throat> And uh, you know, what we find, and this was published by Dahl in 1953, what, what we find is that when uh, people from around the world in various countries, when they eat a high fat diet, they have more cancer or breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. T. Colin Campbell's work, you know, it was kind of fun. We had, we had a lot of discussions, T. Colin Campbell and I, we're, you know, we're good friends. And he did the China study and I had him on my radio show to talk about the China study when it first uh, came out. And uh, he was talking about, well, you need lower fat, lower fat, lower fat. I was, how much lower fat do you need to eat, Colin? He said, ah, you know, I wasn't quite sure. And I said, well, why should you eat any fat? And he came back and he said, you know, it was, it was proportional. The lower the fat intake, the less the risk of getting breast cancer. But there was no cutoff. It's not like at 20% fat, the breast cancer stopped. It was like you went down to 7% fat, which is the lowest you can get. And you were still showing a reduction in risk of getting breast cancer which is essentially unknown in the rural Chinese population. So uh, T. Colin Campbell started recommending a 10% fat diet or 7% consistent with the China study. And by the way, there's a movie out, uh, it's called Safe Haven. And they highlight the, uh, the China study, Colin Campbell's book in the movie, we saw it just a couple of nights ago. Is it on Netflix or any of the other it's channels? On it's on Netflix. Thank you. Safe, safe Haven, is it Safe yeah. Haven, yeah. Great movie, I mean, it's well worth your trouble, even if you're- oh. Didn't, yeah. didn't want to see the China study book in reference to eating better. Occasionally movies come out, they'll have uh, uh, my book, Colin's book, they'll have our, they often have our foods. Uh, Dr. McDougall's right yeah. foods, they appear every place, you know, on people's shelves, on their kitchen and so on. You watch in the movies, you'll see Dr. McDougall's right foods sit on their counter. Why? Because these actors and actors, you know, they want to be trim and healthy too. And, you know, just like the rest of us. Yep. But this woman's star was sitting in her bed reading the China study. Yeah. And um, they didn't talk about it too much, but it was just. But you know, they talked, I think the subject of diet came up a little yeah. bit in the dialogue. Yeah. It was very clear that they were strong promoters of T. Colin Campbell's work. Yeah. Thank you. We'll watch that tonight. Thank you. Uh, Jocelyn says, how quickly after starting a daily walk for 40 to 60 minutes will my husband see a change in his blood pressure? He's running 120 to 125 over 80, 85, and he's 90% whole food plant-based, no oils at home. He's still overweight, lost 25 pounds, but has 20 to go. He's 5'11", weighs 205. He does hibiscus tea twice a day, two tablespoons of flax in his oatmeal. Found out he has an, an enlarged aorta, but is on no meds. But it's important to keep his blood pressure under control and seems a bit high. That would be a perfect candidate to take the next McDougall program in January. Yeah, yeah, we would love to help you get the, the last part of your journey taken care of painlessly. And we are running a program in January, February, March, et cetera. So, yeah, take a look. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of you. We'll help you get the diet fixed. It's the diet. Uh, exercise lowers blood pressure. 
but it's really the, the food that makes a difference. And by the way, those numbers are what we call at most mild hypertension. You know, they're, they're even questionably hypertension because they're consistent with the average of Americans, which by the way, that kind of blood pressure is associated with twice the risk of dying of heart disease than say a blood pressure of 110 over 70. And it all comes down to the same thing. It's the, it's the food that raises the blood pressure. Uh, it's the food that gives you heart attacks. It's not like high blood pressure damages the arteries and gives you heart attacks. It's the food that uh, gives you uh, sick arteries. And at any pressure, they rupture. Anyway, answer your question. He just needs to refine what he's doing. He should be congratulated on the progress he made, but it's going to be the food that makes a difference. And right now, he shouldn't worry about having, uh, you know, a terrible high blood pressure. It's mild at best. It's below what the American Heart Association recommends we treat with drugs. It's below what the National Health Service recommends that we treat with drugs. It's below what the Cochrane Collaboration recommends that we treat with drugs. They recommend uh, somewhere between 150 and uh, 150 to 160 over 90 to 100 millimeters of mercury pressure sustained for months before you initiate drug therapy. So, you know, you're not even a candidate to go to the doctor and get drugs. And there's only one drug I recommend for treating high blood pressure, it's called chlorothaladone. And you can, you can look at our website, drmcdougall.com, and you can find a full discussion of how I treat high blood pressure. Right. But we, we've had so many people come through the program with moderately high blood pressure like that. Yeah. And, you know, a couple of days later, when we see them for their morning chat, it's like, oh, my blood pressure went way down. Yeah. Just, just by changing a few things that you learn in the program, uh, it, it makes a difference. Yeah, it really does. And it's, it's not like you have to be perfect, but, you know, sometimes you do. <laughs> and big changes to get big results and uh, you deserve the health that you're asking for, but you've got to, you've got to do the right thing. You can't, you can't be moderate, reasonable, sensible. You've got to just knuckle it down and, and eat a starch-based diet. And pretty soon it becomes your favorite way of eating. It has for all of us. I bet we could have, uh, we just didn't have John at the beginning of the show. We could have probably a hundred people who are listening. Tell you the same thing. I, I love my food. I don't have to apologize to anybody. I, I don't find that old stuff appealing at all. It's disgusting. It's greasy, it's foul. And that's even when it's fresh, it's foul. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, 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 have a, you have a chance to change. It's just a matter of deciding you're gonna do it. And that's all it boils down to is you have to decide. It's like people ask me often, what, uh, how do you write a book? You know, we've written 13 national best-selling books. And the way you write a book is you make the decision to write a book and that decision is you put the first word on the paper. The rest of it's easy. You know, decide for yourself that you really want this for whatever reason. You know, you want to spend time with your grandchildren. You want to have a nice, another nice dinner with your wife. You know, why, why do you want to do this? It's important. And then you decide what you do. And, and we've told you exactly what you should do. We haven't pulled any punches. And we're there to help you. I mean, if you attend the 12-day internet uh, telemedicine program, we take care of you all the way from Dr. Lim, who takes care of your medical issues. And I get involved once in a while, to kind of help out. You know, the old man knows some things that the, the young guy still has to learn, but he does really good. He, he's a, a, one, the best doctor I know outside of, you know, who. And uh, <laughs> so we have support staff that every morning they meet with you. They talk to you about your blood pressure, your blood sugar, and, and they uh, talk to you about your daily meal plan. And then we have all kinds of great lectures by Anthony Lim, Doug Lyle, Jeff Novick, myself, Heather, and, uh, and also some of the patient population that we've had in the past, they come out and they talk about how their lives have been changed. It's, a, it's an amazing program. And it, it costs you about a third of what the resort-based program used to cost. And AJ cooks for us. Oh yeah, and AJ cooks for us too. I know, that's really fun. I really love it. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, just, it's, really, it's really fun to have successful outcomes. And that's one of the most, uh, the most enjoyable things about our program that our staff likes is that, yeah, it's difficult. It's, you know, we run into all, you know, all kinds of problems <clears throat> with people initially making the change, but pretty much everybody gets better. 
you know, pretty much everybody leaves the program and says, that's the best money and time I've ever spent. And now it's just, it, it's effortless. You do it over the internet and, you know, it, 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 there's no barriers. It, it should be easy for you. And, you know, you can always go back to the website and there's a free program on there that I published uh, 30 years ago, which is, you can do it from the free program. And in, in, in some of the books we, I've also put in the free program, it's free. It's free. <laughs> you have to, why did I give it away free? Well, <clears throat> at one time I couldn't sell it. And uh, Mary and I have enjoyed excellent health. We're in our mid seventies. And uh, we feel we owe a little bit back to society for, for spreading this knowledge in our lives. We would like to spread it to other people's. Yeah. You know, you, you tell me where the gimmick is. People look at our website and they go, well, I spent a week looking at your website. Where's the gimmick? You know, where's the, where's the pitch? Where, where, are you, where are you trying to sell me stuff? Well, you know, we have a business and that's the 12 day program, which is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great tool. It'll, it'll make all the difference you, you can imagine. We used to run uh, resort-based programs. We used to run adventure trips, take people around the, around the world on a vacation with McDougal food. But we don't do that anymore. Basically, what we do is we do the, the, the program, the, the 12-day program, which is run by Heather McDougal. And with, with my participation and Mary's participation every day, every day, Mary and I get together with people. Every morning we have a fireside chat and people say they really like that. And prior to our fireside chat, they have meetings among themselves where they can sit and talk about how they're doing, what they think of John and Mary and the rest of the staff. And, you know, it's completely their, their, their time together. And they love that. You know, seeing other people in your, in your program get better is really, really encouraging. And to talk to other people, we have that opportunity every day. And afterwards, too, I have to mention afterwards, the program is, uh, is supportive. We, we take care of you uh, at varying degrees of intensity. We take care of you for a year or longer. You can, you can be on our support list for <laughs> ever. You know, it's just about a year is included in the, in the program. So I don't know what you're waiting for. You know, it's, it, you're wasting time uh, not having the personal appearance and health that you deserve. Yeah. It's, it's just, not now when, right? <laughs> yeah, just fix the food. It's uh, uh, well, Speaking of food, they want to know what Mary's fixing, M Melanie asks, for Christmas. Oh, Christmas. Yeah. Uh, I would guess probably sweet potatoes. Yeah, but see, that, that's not the real question that I answered. You're going to take sweet potatoes over Craig and Nika's. And we're going to have mashed potatoes and dressing. Oh, yeah. They want to know where they can find your typical holiday meal. Back when we used to be hosts for our entire family, and Mary used to cook all, everything. And what did she fix? Uh, well, the easiest way to find it is to go to our website, which is drmcdougall.com. And in the, in the corner where the magnifying glass is, you put... Um, in the search box, uh, holiday meals, and you get a whole, uh, must be 14 pages at right. least. You know, I, when, when Mary put this together, it had been about 25 years ago, I said, Mary, write it so a seven-year-old wouldn't understand this, write it so <laughs> nobody could fail. And so she went in such, such great detail, like, you know, this is when you buy this, and this is when you put, start to put this together and so on. So you, you got it, you got the whole thing very simple for you. And, and, and consider that Thanksgiving and Christmas, well, let's just talk about Thanksgiving because Christmas it gets a little wilder. But Thanksgiving, which is a traditional holiday, is the lowest fat, lowest meat, highest vegetable meal that people have all year long. This is, a big, this is the biggest food celebration Thanksgiving. But that's not what happens. You go to the Thanksgiving meal, you have the healthiest meal of the year, and every meal after that is downhill. It's richer. In other words, more meats, refined foods, oil, dairy, et cetera. It's richer than their Thanksgiving meal. So, and, and, I, and I want you folks to know, I, should I tell them this? And I, I kind of joke, I, thinking that I'm gonna win, win favor, I'm not sure I have. I, I kind of joke about how I'm not vegan that I eat, Thanksgiving, I eat turkey for every other Thanksgiving slice about this big. 
Well, you, you will never know whether I really do or don't, but I can tell you honestly, I didn't <laughs> this past Thanksgiving. Me and our granddaughter, Chloe, who will not touch anything from an animal. She's what, nine years old? Yeah, she's nine. Uh, she and I sat uh, there and we had no turkey at all. And uh, probably, probably next Thanksgiving, I'll do the same. It just is not my thing. I don't eat any animal products. Because and, I, and if you go to the this um, holiday meal planning, it gives you a huge menu, and so you can base it on uh, on what you want to make on how many people you're going to have at your party, and um, the recipes are right there, so you don't even have to look for them. Tells you how to make them. Tells you when to buy the stuff to make them. Uh, it's I can't, it couldn't be any easier. Yeah, like I say, she wrote it for a seven-year-old. <laughs> and I want to know what I'm having Christmas. It's, it's, let me tell you what I'm having, then I'll tell you why. We're having alu gabi, Korean barbecue tacos, saucepan scallop potatoes, barbecue pulled pork sandwiches made out of jackfruit, mushroom and cabbage mushu, green curried potato tostados, and tomato bisque with rice. Do you want to know why I'm having that kind of weird menu? Because I, I want an invitation to dinner is what I want. Really? Oh, it's, it, because Char we work a lot and that's the only day Charles has off to shoot my annual Forks Over Knives video. And so since I, we're just going to eat what we make for the video. Oh, wow. That's great. Wow. Yeah. But you're welcome here anytime. Hey, here, here's a question that gets a lot of people upset because most people are trying to lose weight. But this lady named Jane says that she started this way of eating eight months ago to help her husband who had a heart attack. But now she's losing too much weight. She's 67 and her body mass is 18, 5, 6, and 110. What can I do to stabilize my weight? Well, you, look, you look at my May 2003 newsletter and it talks about what do you do if you lose too much weight? And first of all, it, it is all based on perspective. People who knew you as being 40, 50, 70 pounds overweight, when they see you new, they think something's wrong. It's natural for folks not to wanna to change the personal recognition of other people. And so the initial conclusion will be when those who knew you before is that you're too skinny and maybe you have AIDS and maybe you have cancer. But people who meet you new, they'll look at you and go, wow, you really look great because they don't have this, this, this preconditioning. Uh, it starts out with um, a discussion of Walter Kempter's weight charts. And those are in my November 2016 newsletter. Walter Kempter's weight charts will shock you, but it explains to you why you haven't lost too much weight based upon what Walter Kempter recommends. Uh, I'm lower than Walter Kempner, so is Mary, We're lower than Walter Kempner recommends, but we seem to be doing okay. We, yeah. You look good to me, Mary. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, <laughs> you, but you can fix that too. If you want to gain some weight, you just, uh, in a relatively healthy way, you eat more bread, more pasta. We talked about that, about more refined products. Uh, you would uh, <clears throat> eat more fruit, maybe add some fruit juice to your diet. And then as a last effort, you'd add high fat plant foods like nuts and seeds and avocados. I, I can make a meal plan that's uh, 80, 90% fat, 80 to 90% fat. The fat you eat is the fat you wear out of those vegetable foods. You know, nuts and seeds and avocados are fattening. Oh man, I haven't touched them in 10 years. And I get a lot of grief for that, Dr. McDougall. People say that I'm killing people. I don't tell other people not to eat nuts, seeds, and avocado. I just haven't touched them. And it'll be 10 years on January 2nd. And I haven't dropped dead. Yeah, you know, <laughs> AJ, you're a very determined person who takes action when you see something that's true for you. And, and you're committed. You're in many ways like me is, okay, that's the way it is. I'm going to do it. And uh, you've, you've maintained your personal appearance and your, you know, the trim body weight that I'm sure a lot of people are very, very envious of. I've seen you in a, in, in a fancy dress, man. You look good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, it's just like once you get it, it's like when you've been fat for 50 years, why would you want to risk anything to do that? Because I feel so bad for people that lose, they lose tremendous amounts of weights and they gain it back. Yeah. Well, it's because but don't you have people that say to you that you're too skinny? Oh, it's like Dr. McDougall said, the only people that tell me that I'm too skinny are never as skinny as me. It's like, you know, it's like these famous, it's like people that bash you on social media. 
they're like famous people never bash people, right? Like they're not doing that. And it's like, the only people that ever tell you you're too thin are people that are heavier than you. So how can you listen to them? Yeah. Well, well, the reason people give up on diets is because they're approaching it from the point of view of causing themselves the pain of hunger. You can't sustain that kind of pain. It just, just, that's why 90% of people regain the lost weight is they can't stand to be hungry. It's like, it's like asking somebody to be thirsty or to be short of breath. These are natural survival mechanisms that you can't beat. The only way you can beat them is to make yourself sick. And you do that with low carb diets. Low carb diets make you sick. That's how they work. Initially, you lose water weight, about eight pounds because you mobilize your glycogen stores. After that, you go into ketosis, which is a condition that occurs when you're sick. You're either sick or you're in pain until you discover a starch-based diet. Then all of a sudden, everything's within your control. You know, if we were selling you something that, uh, you know, a supplement or something, that'd be one thing, but this is potatoes and corn and rice and beans and just eat it. In fact, you know, our diet is so simple. It's just like yours, AJ. It's, you know, Mary and I have the same few things every day to eat. Love it. I've gotten sick of eating the same thing every day for like 10 years. I just, sweet potatoes and broccoli, what could be better? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, may, it also takes a lot of the worry out of, uh, out of your meal planning, doesn't it? It makes it so much easier and it's cheap. Yeah, it's cheap. And by the way, we enjoyed the sweet potatoes that you sent to us. Oh boy, I guess I'll have to get another one for, uh, well, what's really the next holiday? Yeah, those are delicious. All right, so question from, this is on autoimmune disease from Michelle. Hi, Dr. McDougall and Mary. Ever since I found you on YouTube, I've been hooked on this way of eating. I'm in menopause for almost five years and have had alopecia three times and thyroid problems. My natural doctor suggests things like prolamine, iodine, B12, AF, beta food. What's your suggestion for curing my autoimmune sy uh, symptoms? To take the McDougall program in January, that's my suggestion. Well, you know, autoimmune diseases, uh are due to something called molecular mimicry. And they're discussed, of course, on our website. What happens is you eat animals. Now, I know you don't eat animals now, but you eat animals, <clears throat> the animal protein, like for example, the hair follicles. Okay, the hair follicles from the pig or the cow are absorbed, proteins from these hair follicles are absorbed through your gut wall in your bloodstream, they appear. And the body interprets these form proteins, in this case from the hair follicles, as viruses or bacteria or some other invading agent. And the body makes antibodies uh, toward these hair follicles. Well, they're not all that specific. So even though they're against the hair follicles of, of pigs and cows, you got hair follicles too. And it's close enough in, you know, it's, it's, it's close enough uh, that, that sometimes the body makes a mistake and it attacks your own hair follicles. Anyway, that's, that's how you get alopecia. As far as thyroid, thyroid is associated with conditions where people have brittle hair and they lose their hair. So thyroid disease is due to the body attacking the thyroid gland. You'll, when you go to the doctor, you'll be told you have autoimmune thyroiditis or in other words, Hashimoto, who in 1917 described this particular condition, a Japanese doctor. So, uh, <clears throat> You ask, well, why is the body attacking itself? Why is my body attacking itself? Well, the same thing, I believe, is that you eat foreign thyroids. You eat pig thyroids and, and cow thyroids. How do you eat pig thyroids and cow thyroids? Hot dogs, sausages. And the body recognizes these as foreign, but not, not totally foreign. But molecular mimicry, you can look it up. Molecular mimicry, copy in other words. And the body attacks your own thyroid gland. And once it's destroyed, it's destroyed. Uh, you need to take supplemental thyroid. And I do not recommend natural armor kind of thyroids. They stink. Why? Because they come from cows and pigs. And uh, they also carry various microbes to you, you know, viruses and prions, et cetera. What I recommend is Synthroid, which is a synthetic thyroid supplementation. I've used it for uh, more than half a century. And I found that if you do it right, there's never a problem. People just do extremely well. So it's a fun, fun way to treat using medication, a supplement. I guess I call it more of a supplement. 
So that may be related to your hair, your hair loss. Uh, otherwise, I can't explain it. You know, there are a lot of things I don't know. So, <laughs> you know, give me a break. Nice. Well, maybe you know this one about thyroid. This is from Armando. Dr. McDougall, it was stated during your last session with AJ that you believe that no one ever dies from the numbers. I'm wondering if you believe this applies to hypothyroid as well. My TSH is 6.85 milli, milli units per liter, but I have no symptoms. Doctor wants to put me on levothyroxine, but I have so far reviewed as I have no clinical indications, been whole food plant-based eight years. Will my condition get worse if I don't take medication. Is there some point where I should take medication based yeah. strictly on the numbers alone, even if I don't have symptoms? Well, this isn't a matter of the TSH level, which is the blood test causing you to have a, a absence of thyroid function. I just explained to you the autoimmune issues. Now, TSH is the only test I use to determine the thyroid status of our patients. Uh, normal TSH level is two micro-international units. If you take too much thyroid, then it becomes lower. And that's not good because taking too much thyroid or having a hyper th hyperactive thyroid gland uh, results in bone loss and heart irregularities and anxiety issues. It's not a good idea. You've got to take the right dose. So what's the right dose? It's uh, a dose that makes your TSH level around two, maybe one, maybe three. Okay, uh, when do I start treating people with supplemental thyroid? When they get to say six, seven, eight, my, uh, TSH micro-international units. I've had people with uh, TSH levels of 20 and 30. They're in big trouble. You know, people do die from this condition. You know, they get, uh, anyway, they get all kinds of heart complications and other complications. You don't wanna leave a thyroid condition untreated. And any doctor, any competent doctor out there in your community knows how to treat thyroid, hypothyroid issues uh, easily. And so it's not like you have to search for an expert. Everybody's an expert. Yep. This is one of the standard therapies, the least toxic therapy I know of. It makes such mo so much sense. You've destroyed your thyroid gland. You need to have that hormone. The thyroid gland's the master gland in the body. It affects, affects every tissue. Fix it. And then it repeats your TSH level. It takes, uh, uh, takes about three to six weeks for uh, Synthroid, which is T4, to start working. So you gotta wait, uh, you gotta wait uh, at least three weeks and probably as long as six weeks before you see the effect of the supplement you take. So don't be fooled by starting the supplement, checking the blood test a couple of days later and it's not fixed. It takes a while for the, for the hormone to, to become active. So I want to respect your time. There's 13 more questions. You want to save them for next year? I don't. Whatever you'd like to do, uh, AJ. We don't have any particular issues. At, any pressing? No, no pressing engagements. I'll I'll whiz through them. This is. This I, I, I'm, I'm going to have I'm going to have for lunch last night's leftovers. What was what was last night's dinner? Oh, leftovers from the night before. <laughs> oh man, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, no, what I had I, I had. Um, three different kinds of leftovers. One was rice and one was um, a bean dish and one was uh, uh, Spanish rice. Well, one was just, um, uh, just just a grain, just a and you, rice. You use that microwavable brown rice, yes? Yeah. And I, and I put that all together and it didn't look like it was enough. And so I, um, I took some frozen vegetables out of the freezer and heated them up and added it to it and, and, it, made, and it made too much. And so now we have something left and, for lunch you, today. you have leftovers from your leftovers. Yeah. yeah we, we have uh, several, uh, several good sauces that you use yeah. on them to make, give them different tastes. I just sent you some for Christmas. You did. Yeah. And that's, it, one of them's really spicy, blazing habanero. You know, we use, uh, we use more and more frozen food these days because we don't want to go out. Uh, we, don't want to, we want to keep our exposure to the public as minimal as possible, and you know why. So we'll go to the grocery store maybe once every two weeks, and the fruit's not going to last two weeks, and the vegetables aren't going to last for, for very long. But we found that buying frozen fruit and frozen vegetables, Mary can make a very easy, very convenient uh, meal for us right away. And 
And of course we have oatmeal every morning for breakfast. I buy that in the 20 pound bag. <laughs> and and we add frozen, frozen fruit. fruit yeah. Frozen fruit and vegetables all or and oatmeal, frozen fruit and oatmeal. Oh, you can't beat beat that. <laughs> yeah. Nice. You know, it's it's simple. Consider the fact that most people have walked this earth have lived on a single starch with fruits and vegetables in season. They didn't have a grocery store with 60,000 items in it. You know, they ate, they ate from their local environment. They, they like the three sisters I showed you about, they, the story of the American Indian, the Native American, that's probably the right way to say it these days, isn't it? Yeah. The Native American, and here she is. She's uh, uh, planting a, a beans, corn, and squash, which by the way, they complement each other as far as their growth goes. One supplying nitrogen for the other. And Isn't that um, Sacagawea? Yeah, that's right. From, that's, that's right. That's who it is. From this area. Yeah. The, the three sisters. That's what you should be eating. You yeah. Know, the, oh, the, the, the Native the American was here for you know a long time, thousands of years, before it, the, the invasion from Europe. And of course, it yeah. took a while before that invasion for Europe we decided that we we're all going to eat like kings and queens. So I mean, the last 50 years, 75 at most, that people have eaten this way. This is a this is a blip in history. This is something that could and should be fixed. You are a starch eater. You are a starchivore. You have you're, you're 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 helpless unless you have this understanding. You eat like most people have who have ever walked this earth. Pick a starch, pick two starches, pick 10 starches. 90% of your meal plan by eyeball, not by measurement, not by counting calories. You just look at the plate and you go up, oh, most of it's starch, 90% starch. I'm gonna have some vegetables along with it. If you wanna lose more weight, you can make it more vegetables. And that's part of the maximum weight loss program. But it's so seldom, as I say, you know, you can look at populations of 2 billion Asians. Nobody's overweight before 1980. You know, they had, they had financial problems, they had infidelity issues, they had children who gave them trouble. You know, they had all kinds of stresses in their life. Many of them did not exercise. They were school teachers and, and uh, preachers and, you know, shop owners. And they, didn't, they weren't out working in the fields, heavy exercise, but they all were trim. Why were they all trim? Because the natural habitus of the human body is to be trim. It's your best chance of surviving to be trim. Eh, maybe put on a little fat for the winter. You know, Dr. Regal, I believe what you say about the fat you eat is the fat you wear. I have it on a t-shirt. I have it on a mug. I have it on a, a card. But why is it Charles eats so much fat and cannot get in fat, no matter what he does? I mean, he, he keeps, I mean, he, he like we force feed him nut butters and bread. And and why why isn't the fat he eats the fat he wears? Why is he such an anomaly? There are there are just some people who are skinny even in the face of all those calories. I don't know. Uh, they maybe you know there are a couple of possibilities. One is he's a very active guy. I've noticed he's he's always well. He I, I, he's married he, to me, right? So he's got to. Be. He just doesn't sit around. I mean, he's always moving. He's always you know fidgeting. No, he is. He's something. always fidgeting. Yeah. Yeah. So he's burning a lot of calories that way, and. He may not be absorbing the fat as efficiently as, say, some of us do. Uh, there are people who, uh, who don't absorb fat well. And, uh, you know, what happens is they usually get diarrhea. I know I don't want to, to get in, Char in Charles' history, but, <clears throat> yeah, uh, you know, people do uh, differ in their, uh, their uh, response to food. I smell the peanut butter jar and gain five pounds. I don't even have to eat it. You know, I'm that way too, AJ. I mean, I eat a lot of food and, and uh, you know, sometimes well, we don't, yeah, we don't necessarily you restrict. You don't gain. No, I, I, I'm 140 pounds. Walter Kember says I should be 150. Wow. I, I used to be, I, you know, many of you knew me from a time when I was 150 to 180 pounds. But I was traveling. I was traveling all over the United States selling books on various TV and radio shows. And, you know, it was hard. And uh, of course, it gave me a chance to, to be a bad boy on occasion, too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when Mary and I got married, I, I, I was, I was uh, 190 pounds. 
And uh, my highest weight that I can remember was I was 228 pounds. And that was when I was 22 years old working in the hospital. And the reward for working at the hospitals in Grand Rapids was free food. So you could go to the cafeteria lines as much as you wanted and fill up with burgers and pork chops and so on. And I got up to about 228 pounds. So that would be 30 uh, and seven, let's see. <laughs> So 30 and say that's 90 pounds I weighed. So I, I've been there. I know what it is. And I, I certainly don't want to be that way again. Mm -hmm. When your mother calls you fat, you know you got trouble. <laughs> that's funny. All right. If, I'm going to just keep talking until you tell me to stop. So because well, you know, I'm going to go to the bathroom if, 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 and then I'll be back. Yep. If, if, if people get tired of listening to this, they always hang up. Maybe you ought to put a an edited version of this. Well, so far, they don't see if you guys type in the chat. If you're tired of listening to Dr. McDougall, I doubt that would ever happen. But this is an interesting question from Sandra. She says, someone pointed out that potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplants contain nicotine. Is there a difference between ingesting and inhaling nicotine? Is the amount of nicotine in nightshades as detrimental as smoking? No, no, not so. Um, you know, you don't want to eat spoiled potatoes. Uh, they have, um, you know, they, they, you see it as a green toxin. And, uh, you know, when you eat a plant, you're eating a perfectly balanced organism that has, uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, of effects where the outcome is good. When you start refining it, like for example, when you take, uh, you take, uh, was amygdaloid out of uh, apricots and you get a cancer chemotherapy drug. I remember that in the old, in old days to talk about that. You, you've taken a perfectly good apricot and you've turned it into a cancer fighting drug. Uh, when you start refining things, what happens is you lose the natural balance in the food, which has been something that's been designed and going on for hundreds of millions of years. Uh, this planet's been around for a long time and millions of years of, of evolution. Uh, you know, God or nature or however you want to put it in your mind of what, what is happening. It's a, it's a miracle. I, I'm so overwhelmed. I, you know, I find it upsetting that I don't get to see what the future is going to be. There was a program on yesterday on Sunday mornings. See, I think it's called CBS Sunday morning. It's about how they just launched this telescope. That's going to be a million miles out in space, and they're going to be able to see the, the beginning of time and have all kinds of visions of different planets and solar systems. I would really love to be alive to see that. And I won't. You know, just because I'm my age, you, you know, everybody, everybody has the same outcome. But you know, it, it's so exciting the world we live in now. It's just too bad that we have done such damage to it it's not it's not hopeless that's why we have the new website coming out called diet therapy for planet earth you can do your part as far as uh cutting warming warming uh, gases yeah you can do your part you, you can cut your uh your production of uh global warming gases by 80 percent overnight by changing to a vegan diet so Get busy. You wonder what you can do besides uh, driving a hybrid car or recycling. But change your food. Then you can help your grandkids, your kids have a, a possibility of a future. And it, it could be an exciting one. Yeah. I'd like to believe so. I'd like to believe that we are just going to get things so fixed and just move on. And, and uh, our civilization, maybe someday we'll be like uh, Star Trek and get to visit other worlds. And, but, you know, that's kind of like I'd like to live in that kind of a world where it's, it's, it's full of optimism. I love Star Trek. That was good. What do you watch on TV? Oh my goodness. We, we have a whole list of, of, uh, of movies that we've enjoyed. And uh, we share those with family and friends. But uh, we, also, we also watch uh, some of the new shows like, well, you tell her. Oh, we watch Rachel Maddow. Well, that's that's the political show. <laughs> Shepard Smith. That's yeah, that's a good news show. Yeah, Shepard Smith's good. And uh, we do. We, oh, you we, don't we do. want political shows. Huh? Well, you know, if you tell people you watch uh, MSNBC, they know what you're. Oh, okay. Thinking is you, but we also watch Fox News. Yeah. Yeah. 
just got to see what the other the other people are thinking. So, uh, but how about the entertaining shows that we watch? We have a few series we had. Queen's oh, Gambit. Oh, the Queen's Gambit. Yeah. And we like Ted Lasso. Oh, Ted Lasso was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. And, yeah. The, and the morning show is really good. Really good, too. Wow, we watched some of the same things. That's so cool. Yeah. No, no, good TV is good TV. I, I, I am kind of the elected person in the family to sort through all the garbage. And I have to go through about four, four movies before I find one that's good on average. But they know, my family members know that when I say, you got to watch this one, you got to watch this one, it's good. But, you know, I, that's kind of what I do is I go through the garbage. Yeah, we sit at night, you know, after we have our meal and after we clean up and after we're kind of ready to settle down for bed. And then we go through movies that John has picked out. And after about um, 10 or 15 minutes, if we both hate it, <laughs> then we go, go to the next one. But there are some good movies out there, some good shows. But we have, we have an amazing society, a wonderful world. Oh my goodness. Seems like such a shame not to make it even better. And we are, you know, we're doing it in our way, which is fixing the food. It's the food. It's the food for our personal health. It's the food for the environment. But, you know, I, I used to think back in uh, 1978, you know, we'd already changed our diet for a year. I, I used to think that all, the, all you had to do was release the truth and everybody would clamor to it. And I discovered that was not true. I, I, I remember telling my chief of staff that, you know, people are going to flock to my office door. There's going to be a line from the Honolulu International Airport to my office waiting to see me because I have the cure. You know what? That line's never formed. Uh, we've had a chance to take care of a lot of people. I had a lot of fun doing it. But uh, I'd have to say, if you're going to look at the overall picture, the, those people who are teaching unhealthy things are, are dominant. I mean, consider the fact that when I was a kid, 17% uh, of the population was obese. Now it's up to 30 to 40%. It's predicted that as many as 70% of people will be obese, not just overweight, but obese people from Mississippi and Louisiana and Georgia. And, you know, the Southeast part of the country are particularly uh, susceptible to uh, this, the bad diet. And uh, the prediction is by 2030, somewhere around 70% of people will be obese, not just overweight, but obese. Well, don't you notice um, like when you go out shopping, which is which we don't do except very rarely these days, but almost everybody in the store is overweight. Even, yeah, you don't see skinny people anymore. Even on the commercials on TV or, yeah. or, or you know, particularly commercials on TV it was a big shift to, uh, I guess they wanted the consumer to identify with them. And of course, when everybody is overweight who's watching the TV show, you don't want to have skinny yeah, people. You don't, you don't see skinny people much. Yeah. Um, yeah, yet when you watch a movie from the 50s, everybody, except for maybe one character actor, like say Stubby K in Guys and Dolls, was lean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. everybody was white back then too, remember? <laughs> those were some those are some bad times <laughs> oh boy so karen has a question what's your thought on organic versus conventional we recommend organic but we don't teach it and because we don't want to put up another obstacle but mary and i make great effort to, to buy organic you know at the very least it helps the farm worker because they're the ones that have to apply the you know the herbicides the pesticides at, uh, you know, at, at, at the most relevant issue is, is that these chemicals cause brain damage, including Parkinson's disease. And uh, in fact, it might be a little, a little fun for you is, is go to the internet, look up uh, Parkinson's disease and pesticides or, or organophosphates. You'll be overwhelmed. You'll, you'll read for the next week scientific research that clearly shows that Parkinson's is due to poisoning of the substantia nagra of the brain with organophosphates. So brain damage is expected, more severe brain damage like Parkinson's, uh, cancer initiation and promotion as this lecture I gave you at the beginning of this hour, you know, these are the consequences. And boy, the runoff, you know, you see what's happening to the environment by this kind of behavior. 
it's all it's all it's greed it's, na it's natural human behavior greed here, uh, yesterday, Dr. McDougall was the GI Health Summit and you gave your lecture um, and it was wonderful. And I guess uh, this, le this question from Kathy, it's possible that she saw the lecture. It's about gut motility. Is low sodium a cause for concern? Can it impact gut motility, slowing it down, contributing to constipation in a 61-year-old SOS-free plant-exclusive eater? I, I, don't, I don't know that. I've never, uh, never known a mechanism where sodium causes uh, looser bowels and lack of sodium doesn't. It may be that when you're on a low salt diet, you're not eating as much food because it doesn't taste good. That's why we don't recommend a salt-free diet because I want you to eat the food. And so we recommend a starch-based diet with, uh, with the use of salt and sugar and spice as a condiment on the surface of the food because I want you to eat the food. And uh, I ran into an interesting issue. Uh, as I say, I get involved with the 12 day program patients, uh, every program. And I ran into an issue where uh, a lady said she got constipated when she switched to our diet. And, you know, there's no reason to question her. She was trying to convey to me a change that took place. Well, it took me a while to figure out what happened. What happened was she was having bowel movements prior to us because of the fat and the food. Fat fat causes the liver to produce bile acids. These bile acids get into the large intestine and cause loose stools. In fact, they cause explosive watery diarrhea, 20 stools a day. Uh, it was published in 1970 in the, 1973 in the journal Gut by a doctor named Andreessen. And by the way, you'll get all these scientific articles when you, when you attend the program because that's part of the, the benefits we offer you as a full access to our our archives and videos and so on. Anyway, Andreessen found out in his patients who had problems with bile acids, you know, due to a high fat diet and due to damage to their intestine, that he would uh, change people from having, you know, 20 or more watery stools a day. They're tied to the bathroom to uh, two to three form stools within 72 to 42 to 48 to 72 hours. Yeah. So uh, what happened with this patient is she cut the fat out of her diet. The fat was causing her bowel stimulation. So she was having quote normal bowel function. And when she got the fat out, <clears throat> then she had a, a, a problem with uh, no more stimulation from the bile acids produced by the high fat diet. So what did I do? I put her on some, what's Chris, Chris is called? Yeah, Swiss, yeah. Swiss, Swiss, Chris, Chris. Swiss, Chris, which is a uh, kind of a fiber supplement. and. Uh, a little bit of prune juice and uh, she's doing really well. Not a problem. Great, okay. So this was a question, where did it go? I'm so sorry, I jumped screens. Uh, but um, um, uh, I don't wanna go, you don't wanna talk about COVID, right? <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't care. I actually, I actually find it one of the more interesting things that okay. I want to Well, and Nadine says, do you endorse getting I just the COVID vaccine booster? Absolutely, absolutely I do. I'm a real doctor. I'm a scientist. I believe in science. You know, these vaccines are, are far from perfect, but uh, I believe, unless I consider the experts out there who I think are, are honest, hardworking people, you know, I consider this to be scientific fact based upon studies. And what I hear, what I understand, what I read is that uh, vaccination for COVID, at least now, against the Delta variant and the COVID-19 original virus uh, is effective, particularly at keeping you from ending up in the hospital on a ventilator, dying of your, dying by drowning in your own lung fluids for two weeks and then dying. You know, that dramatically reduces your risk of that. And Mary and I are fully vaccinated and we'll get the next shots that come out. We'll take those. And, but, but don't forget a more important, more effective, safer way to enhance your chances of staying healthy is to eat a healthy diet. If you notice uh, people who are uh, in the pictures and the ICUs that you see on your evening news, uh, you know, most of them are obese. They have what we call comorbid factors. And if you have comorbid factors, which are the things that we cure, the things that are due to the Western diet, uh, you're the kind of person who ends up in the hospital, ends up dying, ends up having complications. 
So it's one thing you could do that's cost free. Get rid of the comorbid factors. <laughs> You're <laughs> suffering from food poisoning and you can fix that right away. So, you know, we have some confidence uh, in the fact that both of us are real healthy. We're older, I told you we're in my mid seventies. Uh, we have taken advantage of the vaccines and the booster and uh, we'll take advantage of any other vaccines that come out that suggest they'll help us. And I, I'm not gonna throw the baby out with the wash water. It's just the way it is. The other thing that we do more and more is uh, we are isolated, which is painful. You know, we're getting to a point where we're having trouble visiting our grandkids again because of what's going on in the world. You know, for a while there, we were really, really isolated. You know, we had our Thanksgiving dinner outside in the garage with, uh, with these you know, heaters. You know, for a while there, we'd never go into our, our, our son and daughter-in-law's home because of the fear of COVID. And then we entered another era last summer where we had some indication that if you were vaccinated, things would be better. But you know, it, the statistics show that we're back to a pretty, a, a worse situation. From what I see in the news, you know, with the number of cases, the hospitalization, the deaths, uh, we're at uh, the beginning of a very steep climb. And uh, with the Omicron, how did I do? Omicron. Ah, okay. But the Omicron, uh, you know, the new virus that's so contagious. Uh, do understand that these viruses are carried airborne and they last uh, just like the chicken pox virus used to last or the measles virus. You remember back in the days when we had chicken pox, uh, if you went into a school classroom four hours later or even the next day, you're very likely to check, catch chicken pox. These virus particles, they stay in the air. Social distancing has to be taken seriously. And wearing a mask, although uh, we recommend it, it's not as much distance as you need. You need to be very careful about your interactions. And will we see the grandkids again? Yeah, we, well, we'll okay. because we, we're gonna take the risk. But right now they're, they're sick. Uh, both of the kids are ill with not COVID, but you know, kids that go to school are sick because they, the viruses are passed around. So we didn't see them for the last couple of weeks, the grandkids, oh. they're painful. Question from Gail. Dr. McDougall, have your views changed about supplements? I'm a 60 year old female and I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. I hear a lot about magnesium these days. Right. Well, no, they haven't changed. Uh, but you can say, well, he's just inflexible. <laughs> no, <laughs> supplements uh, are at best, <laughs> I mean, they're, you know, they can be, they can have some, some effects, they can be medicines. Now, supplements like thyroid supplement, you know, that's a, a supplementation I recommend. I think you're talking about vitamins and minerals. Uh, well, if you take vitamin and mineral supplements, you cause nutritional imbalances. Like for example, beta carotene. Beta carotene, when you eat it as a pill, for example, if you eat it as, as a carrot, no big deal because it's properly balanced with other carotenoids. But you take a supplement of beta carotene, concentrated, isolated beta carotene, and it goes into your gut, into your bloodstream, and then into the cells. Well, there are 50 different carotenoids that the body interacts with. There are about 600 different carotenoids in nature, but 50 of them that we have to, uh, to deal with in terms of good health. They are, all, they are all activated by an attachment to a, a carotenoid receptor. In other words, all of these 50 carotenoids, they have to attach to the inside of the cell, to this carotenoid receptor before they can function. Well, when you flood the system with beta carotene, just one of the 50 carotenoids, there's no more room for the other carotenoids. And you increase your risk of getting cancer, heart disease, dying. You know, that's basically what all the studies show. You cause nutritional balances, same similar mechanism when you take vitamin D or vitamin D shots. You need to get these things as they were intended to be consumed. Vitamins, 11 of the 13 known vitamins are, are made by plants, okay? Uh, one is not a vitamin, it's a hormone, it's called vitamin D and the other is B12, which we still recommend. We recommend that you take B12. And uh, there's a lot of discussion on that on the website if you wanna see what I've written about it recently in, in the past. But that's the only supplement we take. If I had adrenal insufficiency, in other words, my adrenal glands didn't work, I would take adrenal supplements. <laughs> If I had thyroid deficiency, I would take thyroid supplements. You know, I can't think of any other supplement offhand, but 
there are for those kind of supplements. But taking concentrated isolated vitamins and minerals is dangerous. The Cochrane collaboration, which I talked to you about the first hour, uh, when they estimated the harm done by multivitamins, you know, the ones my mother used to give me every morning to take with my orange juice, which gave me horrible indigestion and burping for the rest of the morning. Taking these one-a-day supplements, if, uh, if you look at one million users, there are an excess of 9,000 deaths by just taking one-a-day supplements. They cause nutritional imbalances. It's not the way that it is intended for you to take in your vitamins and minerals. You are intended to take them in the form of potatoes and sweet potatoes and rice and corn. And, and these foods are whole as long as they haven't been processed. You don't get beriberi, in other words, thiamine deficiency until the rice has been processed into white rice. You don't get pellagra until the corn has been processed. You know, the tryptophan has been changed in the, in the, in the corn. You, you, don't get, uh, you don't get scurvy unless you go out to sea with your boat filled with grains and legumes and you aren't able to take the fruits and vegetables along or when you did, they spoiled in two weeks. That's the, the great discovery of the British empire was the discovery that if they took limes along, they didn't develop scurvy, which was oh, horribly deadly. And so they became known as the limeys, the British sailors. And the limes would last for months. Uh, it, you know, nature designed it right the first time. Nature did not make any mistakes. This is a, a, an evolution that's gone on for hundreds of millions of years. And, and uh, you know, we should, we should enjoy it rather than change it. I have to say, every time I see, uh, I see people interfering with natural processes, there's always significant harm. You know, whether you're digging the top of a mountain and trying to get lithium out of it or whatever you do. <laughs> it's, it's a sad world, you know, but we're gonna make it, we're gonna make it work because we don't have another one. And we're gonna, we really are. It's gonna take a whole army to, uh, we're gonna be there. We're gonna be there to let we're gonna be there to let our friends and relatives know that, it, that life can go on and it can be better. It's just that we need to take some serious action, which is happening. So Liz says, what is the best time of day to eat starches for optimal sleep? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, shift workers who work in the, in the, at night, not in the daytime, they eat their starch at you know, noon. I, I don't think it makes any difference when you eat. I don't think it makes any difference uh, uh, how many meals you have. I don't think it makes any difference of what, you know, it may, what makes a difference is what you eat. Now I say that about the number of meals you eat. Um, actually, gorgers, people who eat two or three times a day instead of nibblers who may eat 14 times a day. Uh, gorgers have more difficult losing weight and lowering their cholesterol than do nibblers. So those of you out there who are, you know, eating all the time, that's good. It's, it's not a bad thing. And, but it's just eat, just eat your favorite starches, make them, spice them like you like them. So you can eat them. That's, that's the whole thing. It's it, make it available at one time, you know, we've, we've tried a lot of things to help people and they have been really to help people, uh, not to make more money. I could have made more money as a doctor uh -huh. just by a whole bunch of ways that you make money. But one thing we did is we tried to set up a restaurant in Honolulu. Well, fortunately, sanity reached me. <laughs> and we didn't lose everything for that restaurant. And then we set up a food company in Honolulu. And we lost everything except our house. They couldn't take our house. In other words, we, we didn't go bankrupt at that time. And then we set up a food company in uh, California, which, by the way, is an extreme success. It's called Dr. McDougall's Right Foods. They have about 40 SKUs. And they're in uh, 8,000 stores across the country, Dr. McDougall's Rights Foods. And we, along with uh, very important associates, we developed that business in the early 1990s. But, you know, I also lost everything that time too. And, uh, you know, if, if the opportunity came up for me to take a risk, I'd do it. And I, I would take the risk because, and Mary would support me. That's the nice thing about our relationship is, is she's always, always there for me and with me and, gives me every opportunity to make my own mistakes. She's a trooper for sure. Hey, so here's another, we're getting a lot of people that are concerned about their weight being too low today, but this is from Ellen. 
She says <laughs> her smart scale measures her weight at 117 pounds and 15% body fat. And I guess her friends are saying she has an eating disorders and uh, she wanted to know if she should be concerned if her body fat percentage is too low. And how would she know if she has an eating disorder? Well, as, as long as you're eating, you enjoy the food, you don't have an eating disorder. So uh, where eating disorders come about is by a conflict that happens in people. And that is that they eat and they don't get satisfied because it's starch, it's sugar, it's carbohydrate that satisfies the hunger drive. So I, I recall when I was uh, a young man, I've, I've always been a big eater. And when I was a young man, I would uh, of course eat meat and dairy and poultry and oil and so on. That was my diet. And typically what I would do is I'd get big plates of food. The first plate was not satisfying. And of course, I've Second plate wouldn't be a big deal. And after the second plate of food, I started feeling a little bit uh, stuffed. And by the third plate of food, I got my signals it was time to stop eating. I was overstuffed and in pain. Okay, so you, 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 say, you say to yourself, look, I ate and I'm still hungry. I'm out of control. I must have a mental disorder. I must be an obsessive compulsive overeater. Obsessive compulsive overeater. There must be something wrong with me. I need to see a psychiatrist. I need to find out if I got an eating disorder. You got a problem. The problem is, is you're not eating the food that satisfies your hunger drive. And once you do, it all fits into place. It's simple. It works. So uh, just, just, you know, just do it. it we, we used to challenge people for 12 days. Do it for 12 days. What I would tell you is this, is do it for four months. Uh, if you do it for four months, then you have earned the right to come back to me and say the McDougall program doesn't work. And I put that challenge out to thousands of people over the last 50 years, 46 years. I, I've yet to have that I can remember anybody come back to me and said, you know, I did what you said, it didn't work. Lots of people come back to me and say, I, 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 I heard what you said, I understand it, but I couldn't do it. That's fine. It's not, it's not easy. You know, change is not easy. Um, so, you know, I understand that, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, the things that I've learned that I share with you work. I'm the luckiest doctor in the world. My patients get better. My patients get off drugs. Sick people are on drugs. My patients avoid surgery. Sick people go to surgery. Yeah. So if you're tired of, you're tired of dealing with the medical business and all the aches and pains and pills, fix it. It's the food. It's a starch-based diet you need to eat. You need to leave the animals and oils alone and preferably less fine, refined food. Absolutely. There's a question about kombucha from Isabel. Can it be part of her life? She prefers to make it, but sometimes we'll buy it when she's out and about. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah I, I, the idea that kombucha, which I think is made into teas and is some kind of cancer cure miracle. I don't, I don't have any evidence to know that's true. But if you want to just include it as a, as a you know, enjoyable part of your meal plan, fine. How does it come, Mary? Do you know? Uh, well, it's a tea and it's fermented. Uh, and so you can buy it <clears throat> and you can make it yourself and let it ferment um, in your refrigerator or on your counter, <clears throat> or you can buy it. Do we ever, do we ever have it? It's expensive when you buy it at the store. Like a bottle's like $5. Yeah, I, I don't like it. Yeah. It, it. it kind of tastes like alcohol to me. I, I didn't care for it. Yeah. I wonder why people like it. Interesting. So here's a question from Reva. I'm a thin. You know, I'd like to answer that is, is people are so ingrained at looking outside of their body for a solution. If it happens to be a pill called kombucha or a vitamin supplement, you know, as opposed to a doctor prescribed pharmacy given drug, they're always looking to the outside for salvation. You're not going to be saved. You, you got to fix the problem. The problem is malnutrition due to eating the Western diet. That's it, plain and simple. You know, you just got to fix the problem. You fix the food and everything will be fine, which brings me to another story I've told you before, AJ. And that is, I, I used to have a cat. The last time I saw him was October 9th, 2017. He used to come to my back door every day. And uh, most mornings he'd have a, a gift for me a little mouse or a, a mole or a little tiny bird. And he'd 
look up at me with this uh, this animal hanging out of his mouth and he'd smile and he'd go, look, dad, what I brought you. Well, that's not my food. And so uh, in the effort of uh, understanding experimentation, let's enroll Einstein in an experiment. Let's, let's take Einstein and let's feed him baked potatoes. What do you think Einstein would do with baked potatoes? He'd bat them around till he starved to death. Okay, that's not, that's not fair. That's not the experiment I wanna do. I wanna see how Einstein would do on living in a diet of baked potatoes. So what I do is I turn them into mashed potatoes. I take a gastric tube, put it down his throat, and I force feed him mashed potatoes for two weeks. What do you think is gonna to happen to Einstein? He's gonna be lethargic and sick. So I could uh, use some of the techniques that I've been taught to cure diet and lifestyle problems. One thing I could do is I could exercise Einstein. So I'll grab the old dog leash and drag him around the block a couple times a day for a couple of weeks. What do you think will happen? By adding exercise. Okay, okay. So now what I'll do is take the other, the other pillar of the three-legged stool, you know, diet, exercise, and psychological comfort. I'll add that to the program and I'll give Einstein psychological comfort. In other words, every day for minutes, if not hours, I'll rub his ears and his belly. What do you think is going to happen to Einstein? If you got to fix the food, Einstein's a carnivore. carnivore. That's his diet. Don't you dare right, raise your carnivorous animals on, on the McDougal diet. Don't raise your herbivorous children and spouses on Einstein's diet or foods you never, you, some of the foods that we feed our kids, you know, ourselves, if we fed them to our pets, we'd be arrested. The Humane Society would come after us for animal abuse. But somehow it's okay to give your kids cheese sandwiches and glasses of milk and chicken nuggets and whatever. This is, this is child abuse. I wrote a letter to, uh, to Santos from Florida about 10 years ago, and they were, they were doing a, um, it's, it's in the newsletters, you can find it. They were doing a, uh, a thing about how every doctor had to turn in by law, or you, you get punished as a doctor or a dietitian or psychologist. You had to turn in evidence of child abuse to the government in Florida. And so I wrote him a letter about uh, how I'm a license. I was licensed at that time in the state of Florida to practice medicine. I, had my medical degree because I was taking care of the, of the employees of public supermarket. So uh, I had my license, I gave him my license number and I like, said I'd like to report, report abuse. Abuse that's being done by schools. It's done by nice members of family like policemen and teachers and priests and not priests, <laughs> ministers and, and uh, they're, they're committing child abuse and the pain is real. The pain of being overweight, acne, greasy skin, stomach aches, headaches, this is real. And uh, I got no response. I sent, actually sent that off to their bureau on two occasions saying, you know, you guys ought to take action. I pointed out child abuse. And if I don't point this out to you, you'll arrest me. I'll be punished. Anyway, you'll find that newsletter on someplace on the website. Look up Florida. Cool. Look up Florida. Look up... Uh, Child abuse, I think it was Rick Santos. I think he was governor then when I wrote this. Okay, all right. So this is from Reva. I am a thin type one diabetic and take between 26 and 30 units of insulin per day. Am I at greater risk of breast cancer or any cancer for that matter because I take insulin? Uh, no, it depends on what you eat. The problem with type 1 diabetes is you've lost a very important organ. You now suffer a metabolic handicap because the pancreas has been destroyed in part. And uh, as a result of this metabolic handicap, everything is more damaging to you than, say, if you didn't have the metabolic handicap. Uh, you know, somebody, a, a diabetic who gets an infection in their toe, they must take immediate action or they'll get gangrene and they'll lose their leg. I get an infection in my toe because I got all the organs working good. I could wait six months before I did anything. Well, big deal. So because you have this metabolic handicap and you are eating, and maybe not you personally, but most type one diabetics 
are eating a diet that kills people, gives people cancer, heart disease, diabetes, oh, they've already got diabetes, you know, cancers and all kinds of, that don't have a metabolic handicap. What do you think happens to you? The, the only patients I've seen, well, first, let me start out within 11 to 70, within 11 to 17 years of diagnosis, most diabetics have suffered a major complication, eye damage, kidney damage, heart attacks osteoporosis, et cetera. And yeah, you have a higher risk of cancer, but not due to the insulin. It's due to the fact that you have this metabolic handicap, plus you're still eating the rich Western diet. The only patients I've seen with type one diabetes who've had, who have had all their parts working 40 to 50 years later were Walter Kempner's patients. And I had a chance to see a few of them and uh, they lived on the rice diet, which was rice, fruit, fruit juice, and simple sugars, but it was basically the McDougal diet. You know, they didn't stay on the, on the therapeutic rice diet. They stayed on starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables and everything was functioning. So I, I think it's, a, it's a, a, a great reward for the patient and for me as a practicing doctor to share this message with type one diabetics. Their pan pancreas will not grow back. But what does happen is that immediately when you switch the food is their insulin requirements become much less. Uh, typically, I'll drop the insulin dose by about a third the night I change their diet, so they don't have hypoglycemic reactions. But they'll always take insulin. Uh, I usually use a long-acting insulin like Lantus, and they can get by with one shot a day. I don't use insulin pumps. They're very dangerous. They ruin people's lives. Uh, I don't use regimes of um, multiple doses of insulin and pills. They're trying to chase around the blood sugar. We know that it increases the risk of dying this aggressive treatment, now, particularly with type two diabetics. We know that's proved by six major studies. So uh, as a type one diabetics, you, you, you've got to realize, you know, just like, you know, I've had to face the fact that I had a major stroke when I was 18 and the left side of my body still doesn't work 50 some years later. But I, I live with that. You have to live with the fact that you lost your pancreas probably due to cow's milk consumption when you were a child. It's called molecular mimicry. It's where the body attacks the pancreas due to a segment of 17 amino acids on the beta casein component of milk protein. All identified. We know what causes it. But are you told to not feed milk to children? Well, the American Academy of Pediatrics says so. They started saying so in 1986. They started telling people that type 1 diabetes was due to consuming milk. And they recommended that you don't initiate consuming milk in young children. That's, that's a work group from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Oh, you know, people know this, but, but it's not translated into practice because it's not, a, it's not profitable. That's it. That's the only reason. It, it, what do we do is, oh boy, I tell you the drugs that are being advertised. We watch a lot of cable news way too much. And uh, the drugs that they advertise, I never, I never imagined that they'd be advertising these kinds of drugs for various kinds of autoimmune diseases. And, oh. you, know, you know, it's just absolutely obscene. But of course, these drugs will cost uh, somewhere between twenty-five dollars and $85,000 per year per patient for just the drug. And, and, well, how can they find enough people with rheumatoid arthritis to make a business out of it? Well, they do, obviously. And this is a disease that's easily curable by a dietary change. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, a couple of the other autoimmune diseases that we treat very successfully. Um, you know, if, if somebody told the truth and put ads on TV that says, you know, if you, if you have these autoimmune diseases, uh, just have to change the food, it'll go away. Who would do that? What company? What, 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 would you invest in stocks in such a company? Find me a way to make money. I'll find you a way to change the world. <laughs> nice. It, you've been going three hours. Do you want to stop or you want to, there's five more questions. Right, let's do the five and then quit. We've, okay. already, we've, already, we've already gone well beyond the point of being obscene. <laughs> well, I never tire of hearing from you. Neither does the audience because they're still here. This is sort of an interesting question from Olga. Is animal protein and plant protein absorbed the same way by our body? And is animal fat and plant fat stored with the same efficiency? It's stored with the same efficiency as far as I know. 
You could do biopsies of people's body fat, like their abdomen, buttocks, or thigh. You could tell what the kind of fats that they like to eat. You eat cold water marine fish, you're full of omega-3 fats. You eat uh, Crisco's and margarines, you're full of trans fats. So the body stores fat, regardless of whether it's from a plant or animal, uh, very efficiently. As far as proteins, there is a big difference in plant and uh, animal protein when it comes to raising cholesterol, for example, or your risk of dying of heart disease. Also, when it comes to feeding people who have liver failure and kidney failure, the plant proteins are much kinder on the liver and the kidneys than animal proteins. So the protein certainly makes a difference as to whether it occurs at the level of absorption at the gut. I, don't, I, I haven't thought that that's the case, but probably haven't thought about it, or whether it occurs at the actual organ, which is the liver and kidneys. Now that's where, that's where the harm comes, but maybe the gut wall's involved in it too. Yeah, there's a big difference between animal protein and vegetable protein as far as bone loss, kidney failure, liver failure, dying of heart disease, it's a big deal. And I think it's true. You know, I think that you can isolate out the proteins and still see the difference. Whereas, you know, maybe the protein is just a marker for the other bad things in the food, the cholesterol, the fat, the contamination, et cetera. I think it goes beyond a marker. I, I, uh, the different pattern of amino acids are particularly damaging. I know they are with osteoporosis. Animal foods uh, not only are high in protein, which means they're high in amino acids, they also contain a very exaggerated amount of sulfur containing amino acids. Uh, these would be methionine and cysteine. And methionine and cysteine, they're sulfur containing amino acids and they break down into sulfuric acid. So the bones have to deal with that high acid load due to animal food intake. So yeah, big deal, it's a big difference. Great, thank you. I keep. Okay, so this is from Marie. Could Dr. McDougall please tell me about chronic sinusitis, rhinitis, if you found anything in the diet that works for improving it, like specific foods to eat or avoid? I guess she's had this from environmental hay fever type allergies and lost her sense of smell many years ago when it was bad and her sense of smell hasn't returned. Well, that may, that may, not, be, that may not be fixable. You might have uh, destroyed the... the the olfactory nerves, the, what we call nasal hairs. So it might not be fixable, but yeah, there are some things there. First of all, there's all that stuff in the air, all the pollutants, all the, uh, the uh, uh, plant pollen, all that stuff in the air that's very irritating. Uh, so, so, you know, that's, that's an important cause. And of course you need to get an air filter and that may help and you know, control your environment a bit. Uh, the other thing is, is that when you eat the Western diet, you have a lot of reflux. You know that, Nexium and Prilosec told you that. You know, you got GERD, you got reflux. Well, that reflux, uh, reflux is up into the esophagus, into the back of your throat, where it damages the vocal cords, you get hoarseness and cough. And that acid is, goes up into the sinuses and causes chronic sinusitis, and it's inhaled in the lungs and causes asthma. Every doctor knows this. And so a standard recommendation for doctors taking care of patients who have these problems, loss of enamel from their teeth, hoarseness, cough, bronchitis, sinusitis, asthma. A you know, standard doctor recommendation is to raise the head of your bed so at night you don't have all the acid reflux. And they should go on further and tell you to stop eating acid producing foods. These are your animal foods. Therefore, you need a lot of acid if you're a carnivore like Einstein. Einstein had seven times more acid concentration in his stomach than I have in mine. Is he supposed to eat an animal food-based diet? I'm not. So decreasing milk and meat and intake is very important as far as reducing the acids. But another uh, implementation that doctors will offer you is, uh, is antacids. And they'll offer you antacids in the form of proton pump inhibitors, toxic. These, these proton pump inhibitors like Prilosec, Nexium, Prevacid, a whole bunch of them out there, sold over the counter. What they do is they, they inhibit the passage of acid from the body, the bloodstream, into the stomach. Okay? And yeah, that may cure your indigestion, but that acid stays in your body. And so you create a condition of chronic 
mild metabolic acidosis. It may not be so mild. And as a result, people who take these drugs have an increased risk of fractures related to osteoporosis. Because you decrease the acid in the stomach, they also have an increased risk of stomach cancer. Because they decrease the acid in the stomach, they also have an increased risk of pneumonia because the bacteria that give you the pneumonia survive in a stomach without sufficient acid. Toxic. I mean, I, I occasionally will prescribe these drugs for my patients, but it's a last resort. I will have them raise the head of their bed, change their diet, which almost always fixes the problem. The next step would be to take wafer antacids like Tums. And uh, the, the, the other thing that I occasionally do is H2 blockers like Tagamet. I, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of negative things about those, but nothing's as bad as proton pump inhibitors. Yeah, thank you. Marianne says, can renal dysfunction be an adverse consequence related to aspartame? And if yes, do you know if mild renal dysfunction can be improved, reversed after stopping it? I don't know that. You know, I, I don't recall or I've never read that aspartame damages the kidneys. Could be. Uh, you can improve your kidney function by changing your diet. Uh, we have known this in multiple research studies. They've taken people with, uh, with proteinuria, pro protein in the urine, due to leaky kidneys, due to damaged kidneys, uh, particularly in diabetics, and put them on a low protein diet and the proteinuria goes away. In other words, the integrity of the kidneys is improved just like overnight. Uh, if you think aspartame's the problem, then don't, don't eat it. Why would you eat aspartame? What's, it, what's that for? Weight loss? I have no idea. Yeah, aspartame is, uh, it's an artificial sweetener. So it's a zero calorie sweetener. Oh, there you go, it's for weight loss, right? Well, yeah, ostensibly, but it's not, it's not I mean, from the GI Health Summit, none of the doctors are a fan of any of the zero calorie sweeteners. You be taking those oh. things. Artificial sweeteners uh, are, are something you should avoid. Instead, take a, a small teaspoon and put a little bit of brown sugar on your cereal. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, there, there's date sugar. Yeah. There's there's all kinds of sugars made from natural products, um, and we don't recommend any artificial no. yeah, sweeteners at all. And, and they're not even been proven effective for weight loss because they say that it has a what's called a nutritive mismatch that that people don't lose weight from them. Well, the sweetness stimulates insulin production, even though they're non-calorie sweeteners. Insulin drives fat into fat cells. That's one mechanism. So yeah, they're ineffective with weight loss. Uh, uh, we used to serve stevia at our program, our living program, but we stopped doing that because people got so much gastrointestinal distress from it. And it really doesn't make any difference. Whether you have a teaspoon of uh, stevia or a teaspoon of brown sugar, you're talking about 16 calories difference. You eat 3000 calories a day. How is that gonna make a difference? Now, if you're consuming, you know, 300 calories in a soda that are sugar, that could, that could be a big deal. What's going to happen is uh, you're, you're going to rot your teeth with all that sugar. You're going to raise your triglycerides with all that sugar. You're going to be taking in empty calories. In other words, they don't have vitamins, minerals. It's just empty calories. That, that's what you're going to be causing by consuming these simple sugars. Plus, the body wants to burn sugar. It's the preferable fuel of the human body. It's called glycolysis. You learned it in high school. The body burns glucose. So if you provide it with glucose, in other words, sugar, it's going to burn that and leave the fat in your body fat. You, you, that's what's going to happen. So you're not going to lose weight because the body is being energized by the simple sugars. And uh, your fat isn't going to leave. But high sugar diets don't cause obesity either. I could go into that in some discussion, but let's just leave it at it's not a good idea to eat sugar. And certainly uh, if you want to lose weight, it's not a good idea. Great. Thank you. This is a question I haven't heard before from Lori. I was wondering about using nail polish like gel nails. Is it important to let our nail beds breathe? Can the chemicals in polish, polish be absorbed in our systems? Uh, I, I, that's probably a subject I've never even touched on. Mary, do you know? I have no idea either. Yeah. <clears throat> I think they recommend that, that you, um, when you use the gel um, on your nails, that you let them um, breathe naturally without the gel stuff on them for a few weeks before you use it again. 
instead of putting it right back on. But I'm not sure of the reason why. But I would imagine it would be because of the, um, the chemicals in the gel polish, because they're very strong. And they may, may, but may have blocked the absorption of uh, oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. From, uh, we, we had a plant-based dermatologist on the show on the weekend, and she said the problem is the light that they use, the light that your hands go in. Yeah. And so there's been cases of finger cancer with that. I don't know. I still do it. What can I tell you? I live yeah. dangerously. Well, you know, you know, AJ, it's just a matter of making choices and you just hope your choices result in more good than harm. Just like when people ask me about plastic surgery. You know, I say, you only got one life to live. You're not happy with the way you look, fix it. Find yourself an artist though. Don't, don't go to just any plastic surgeon's office. Find somebody who's uh, passionate about uh, their business, who's a creative person, who's an artist. Yeah, don't buy a Groupon. <laughs> Don't buy a Groupon for that. <laughs> anyway, you want to, you know, fix it. You've got uh, 85 years on this planet. You might as well enjoy them the best you can. Right. Okay. So this is the last question. By last question, there's a million questions in the chat, but I can't All help. Right. Well, if, they don't, if they don't send them in, they got to take the time to send them in because it's not fair for people that took the time to send them well, in. Before, before I end, uh, I, I would like to make sure that I'm presenting for you something that you will enjoy and benefit from. Oh, I love it. I mean, I can't imagine the, 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 the 400 yeah. people watching, they're still here. They must enjoy it. Am uh, I right? You know, the presentation I gave last time on, uh, on precocious puberty, how the food affects the estrogen levels. That was a lecture I've always wanted to give and put together and you've given me the opportunity to do it. Just like the lecture today on breast cancer. I've always wanted to put together a lecture, uh, AJ, where I could say, you know, if you were sitting with me in my office, this is what I want you to know. And so I did that with the breast cancer lecture. Next time, I don't know, maybe we'll do osteoporosis. You know, I would like to be able to have a doctor patient relationship with you through AJ's uh, medium and, you know, be, have a chance to do some of the things that I was never able to do in the past. And now I have the time, I certainly have the knowledge where I'd like to make it real personal and I'd like to make it personal and professional. I want to be your doctor and you can assure yourself that everything I tell you, I research carefully and I can defend. Well, make mistake. Elizabeth Ann says, we love your talks, Dr. McDougall. Bless you for taking the time to share them with us. So this is a question from, who is it from? Diane. Okay, it's really, really long, so I'm just going to get to the question part. What is the maximum daily amount of saturated fat allowed in my diet? Eliminating all saturated fat is impossible considering I consume flax seeds, chia seeds, tofu, and some other foods important for breast health. I don't know. I don't know what the maximum. I don't think there's a level. I think that the fewer fats you eat, the better off you're going to be in terms of diabetes and obesity. Uh, you know, it's just too complicated a question to answer because it's, it's, you're getting down to micro details. You know, you need to focus on the real problem, which is the food. Yeah, the food's high in cholesterol. Yeah, the food's low in fiber. Yeah, the food's are high in chemical contaminants. You know, it's, it's the basic food. It's got all kinds of things that we've identified as, as the culprits, but it's really not the cholesterol. It's not the sodium, it's not the simple sugar. You know, it, it's, it's the wrong food. It's just not what people were designed to eat. That, that's, that's where you ought to focus your attention. And instead of trying to find out what you can get away with, oh boy, I can get away with 10 grams of saturated fat. Dr. Well, and, you, and you wouldn't have to eat those things. You don't have to eat black seed. No. You don't have to eat tofu. Well, the, the, this person I would guess is still looking to, uh, to the, the, you know, finding a pill to solve their problems. Yeah. Well, not, she also wanted to know what's the maximum amount of grams of sugar you could have each day. I don't know. I mean, let me just tell you that, a, a, you know, let's just say it depends on your calorie intake. Let's just say the, uh, the sugars are, uh, you eat a starch-based diet. Well, if the sugars come from potatoes, rice, corn, and so on, 80% of those 3,000 calories uh, are come from sugar. Those starches are 80% carbohydrate, sugar. So that's 2,400 calories of sugar you can eat a day. Uh, it, 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 again, you're, you're making micro details out of a, an obvious 
an obvious uh, message that you need to do, which is you eat a starch-based diet. You look at your plate, 90% of the food is starch. Few fruits, few vegetables, you know, no turkeys, no pigs, no cows, no chickens, <laughs> <laughs> no ice cream cones. Hmm. So, you know, it's just, it, it, don't make a big deal out of it, but bigger than it has to be made. You love potatoes, you love bread, you love pasta, you love corn. That's because it's natural. You are a starch eater. Human beings are starch eaters. My cat Einstein hates potatoes. My dog Bailey loves them. She loves rice, potatoes, sweet potatoes. Got a weird cat. <laughs> no, no, she's not a cat. She's a dog. Oh, well, then, see, dogs are omnivores. A dog is a true omnivore. And by the way, it's an interesting story about, about how dogs developed from wolves. And what happened uh, was uh, wolves are true carnivores. But because the wolves hung around the campfires and ate the scraps from the people, they developed an ability to digest starch through development of the production of alpha, alpha amylase in their mouth and in their, in their stomach. And that's one of the main distinctions between a wolf and a dog is the ability to digest starch. Right. And uh, that, that occurred as a consequence of hanging around with people. That's how you got a dog. That's What's what interesting though is it. it's not that she'll just eat them. She'll, she loves them. I mean, if you put down and we've done this, we've put down like rice and sweet potatoes and potatoes and her vegan kibble. And she, she just loves sweet potatoes. Well, one of the, one of the, uh, the, the basic treatments for dog lovers when they get into trouble is to put the dog on a low protein diet. You know, this is a standard recommendation by veterinarians and the dogs spring back to life if you switch them to a low, pro, low protein diet. In other words, you take them off uh, the animal meats and you put them on sweet potatoes and potatoes and the kidneys function better, the liver functions better, the whole body works better. Arthritis often goes away. It's, it's an amazing treatment. And it's a standard recommendation. I used to have a radio show in Honolulu called uh, To Your Health, I think it was called. And it was a show that prepared just before me called Pets and Vets. And I sit and listen to pets and vets, the veterinarians, and they would talk about all the wonderful things they did to dogs by switching them to a low protein diet, by adding the foods that your dog likes, uh, AJ. And I would get on my show afterwards, I'd say, why do veterinarians know all this and somehow human doctors don't? Well, you know, I don't know. Yep. Human doctors, you know, it, so little has changed. I know, I know a lot of you out there are, are, are very optimistic about what's happening and happened. We have the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and more and more doctors interested in the subject, but really true dietary therapy where a doctor treats you with food is extremely rare. You know, Walter Kempney used to do it. Nathan Pritikin used to do it. We do it. But, you know, Weimar Institute in California still does it. There are just a few places that do it. Most, most of the, the dietitians and doctors out there who are getting into, into plant nutrition uh, are still at a very theoretical level. And they haven't really learned how to take care of patients with food. And that's a lot different than learning the biochemical formulas that occur with the interaction of food and the human body, which is basically what doctors know is they know biochemical formulas. You need to know diet therapy. Diet therapy and uh, I've written a lot about it. I have a course on our website on diet therapy, which is uh, CME approved. You get credit for it. I also have a course on the starch solution, which you would really enjoy. You get credit for that too. But, um, you know, I, it, we've got a long way to go before doctors actually use diet to cure 90% of the problems out there in our society. And of course, that would take a big hit on big farm and big hospital and big medical doctor. And this is not gonna happen because there's just too much money in doing the wrong thing. It's the money. It's not a conspiracy, it's just money. It's just human beings acting like human beings. Right. There's a wonderful comment in the chat from Kim. Thank you so much to the McDougals for their time. You've changed my life for the better and I'm so grateful to have found you. Your work is amazing and I appreciate all the things you do to make us healthier and to make our planet better for our children and grandchildren. What you can do is you can join the army. You know, we're trying to make the world a better place. And I, and Mary and I've been at it for 46 years. 
And now, you know, we used to think that all you had to do is tell people why they're overweight, diabetic, had breast cancer, et cetera. And they respond, well, they didn't. And now a very simple message to save the planet is fix the food. And uh, so far my waving hand up there asking for <laughs> attention has not been recognized. Uh, let's, just, let's just hope that there is, is the possibility of having a crack to let the light in. Do you think people will ever get your message? I mean, it's ridiculous that it, yeah. it, it must drive you crazy because it drives me crazy. Well, you know, uh, uh, AJ, I went through a, a cycle where in the 1970s, popular was Nathan Pritikin and James Anderson, the University of Kentucky, treating diabetics this way, and you know, Dennis Burkett. And back in the 1970s, uh, Atkins was condemned. You know, at, at, at the end of the 1990s, I'd written several national best-selling books for Dutton, Dutton, Penwood, Penwood Putton, which is with Dutton now. And uh, my editors came to me in the 1990s, even after being one of the top 5% of authors in their company, came to me and said, you're going to have to change your style of writing. We want you to start writing books that are high protein, high fat, low carb, because we believe that's the trend. And I said, you're crazy. I said, first of all, I don't do this just to make money on books. I do this because I believe it's true. And I said, second of all, the science is absolutely clear that these diets are harmful. It never happened. Boy, was I wrong. And I, and I paid the price for it too, but I would never compromise myself, you know that. And what happened was in the 80s and 90s and still in the 2000s, uh, we have the resurgence of the Atkins diet. And now, now I think we're going in the other way in the pendulum. I think for whatever reason, it's swinging in the right direction. Will it get to a level where it really makes a difference? I don't know. But one thing to think about is that <clears throat> with droughts and floods and fires, you know, the planet is changing and food production is one of the first things that's gonna be in trouble. So you're not gonna be able to afford to eat the pigs and cows and cheeses and so on that you enjoyed in the past. You might as well learn the McDougal diet now <laughs> when it's your choice because you, know, you, you might be lucky someday just to get enough potatoes and corn and rice and beans to eat so you don't starve. The world's changing. But we can make it better. We can. We can. We can fix it. We just got to get together and and uh, I don't know. Get get some good luck. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your optimism. You know, AJ, I I, I can't be any other way because it'd be too depressing. I have to. I have to. It's just like I've always believed that what I'm doing is is right and it's worth the trouble to do. I've never wavered, as most of you know. You know, I, uh, I have to take the attitude that, uh, you know, the human being has the potential to fix very serious problems. I know a lot of people don't agree with me, but uh, I'm going to take that attitude because it serves me and everybody else well. Well, we appreciate so much your work and what you do. This has well, been Yeah, you just thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to talk I, to so many nice folks. I, I present all my new material with you. And uh, I, I, next time we'll, we'll maybe do it on osteoporosis. Well, there's uh, so but, many things. Yeah, there's so many different parts. Monday, right? No, okay. it's, a, it's a, uh, just January, Mary. January 3rd, the first Monday, the, the McDougals will grace us with their presence for McDougal Mondays, the first Monday of the month, which is January, March, no, March, January 3rd, which is a Monday, 2022, first Monday of the year. Well, I hope you should, can share the breast cancer treatment options uh, that I gave in the first part of the presentation today, share it with people you know need this. I, I probably hear from two or three patients with breast cancer, sometimes daily. If, you know, Certainly every week I hear from half a dozen women who've developed breast cancer and want some help. And I'm happy to help them. I mean, I give these services away free. Uh, I don't become your doctor unless you've attended the, the McDougal program. And then I'm officially your doctor. That's the only way you become part of our practice officially. And then I can get real serious. I can talk to your own doctors, which I do sometimes, tell them that I disagree. But, you know, unless we have that kind of official doctor-patient relationship, which is only established by you attending this 12-day program, will I have the option and the opportunity to help you that much? But if tell you, you get within my grasp and I'm going to take you all the way to the end. You know, I, I, if I believe it's right, I'll, I'll fight for you. 
And isn't the next McDougal program, does it still have a few openings in January? I know there's- I don't know if it does. I haven't checked with Heather, um, but- I'm, I would imagine. Yeah. If not, Heather will manage to squeeze. Yeah, she has some way of squeezing people. a couple she people has in. A few, she has a few yeah. ways of squeezing people in. Yeah. Nice. Especially if you're needy, if you're needy and you use AJ's name. You That's say, right. Well, I'm one of Chef AJ's followers. <laughs> and it makes a big difference. That's fantastic. It's so great. Well, so great. This will be probably the last time we see you this year, but thank you so much and have a wonderful holiday. Well, we and look forward to it. Uh, thank you. You too. Yeah. And have fun with your with your Christmas dinner. It sounds like no, it's gonna be so untraditional with all those different ethnicities, but oh, it's, it's gonna like, be fun. Yeah, and you know, fun. there's always overnight mail. <laughs> in fact yeah it's sending things in dry ice that's i wish we lived closer Char yeah that's just uh but you're you're happy in oregon now uh it's okay i can't <laughs> say i can't say it's where we're going to stay for very much longer but yeah it's okay it's a nice place to live and we've been we have the advantage of our son and daughter-in-law but you gotta be near some of the grandchildren yeah yeah, yeah we, we have uh we we love our grandkids and we've developed some pretty good relationships with them over the years. Well, where would you yeah. go? Where, where, where on the planet would you prefer to live if you could live anywhere? Uh, well, you know, we're, we're kind of thinking of that maybe, well, I, I don't want to say, I can't say. Oh no. Okay. Not, but you know, we're, we're kind of getting a little bit homesick for Santa Rosa, California. And, uh, you know, we had to move because of the fires. And uh, yeah, but now somebody's in your house. Yeah, Heather's in, I, now Heather's in the new house. <laughs> and, and you know what? She built a granny unit. That's great. Oh, so wow. yes, I, I'm the only grannies that they'd have. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe she'll invite us in. I don't know. Well, California would love to have you back. So anywhere you move. Uh, is I love California. I love Hawaii, too. Those are different parts of our lives. And Oregon's been a nice, nice place to live. I don't want to say anything negative about it because there's nothing negative oh, no. to say. It's just kind of cold, isn't it? Yeah, not, not really, not cold enough. <clears throat> we were going to have the grandkids up skiing this weekend. Well, you wouldn't wear your short sleeve shirt today, so obviously it's cold. Uh, it, it is cold. It's it's colder than I like it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's cold. It's rainy, but it's supposed to be. You know, that's that's the thing about Portland. When I used to come here and sell books, which I did uh, back in the 1980s, I was here at least once a month. I, I never saw a sunny day in Portland. That was 20 years ago. And now, you know, it's something we look forward to, a cloudy, rainy day. It, they, they become quite unusual. And of course, you know why that is. And of course, you know what we can do about it. You can stop eating the, the most destructive uh, item of the, the animal foods. Particularly, well, I'm not gonna say particular because they're all, they're all toxic to the environment. Yeah. We can do this. We can fix this. We gotta fix this. We have no choice. It's not like we, you know, unless unless aliens come from outer space and save us, we're gotta save ourselves. Amen. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Mary. You might think again. You might think about putting this up because we kind of. Uh, oh, it goes up right away. It goes up right away. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, it, it never me. leaves. It never leaves. Tell people they can stop watching every time, anytime they get tired. It's the same old dribble. Nobody gets tired of you. We should just have all McDougals all the time, like 24 uh, hours. That wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be any fun. That's great. Well, right. I, I love controversy too. So uh, You do. Yeah, that's true. Well, yeah. we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you so much again. All right, AJ, you have a wonderful holiday. And all you folks out there, you know, really been nice of you to share with us and spend a little time and spread the good news. Yeah. Great. Take care. And thanks everyone for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time when my guest is John Kohler. Take care, everybody.